Whoa, let's go back to uh, Theodoro's game because even though he's, it's still quite possible. Wait, did Mystic oh. just blunder rookie five? I'm sitting here D5 like it, rook, it, it, it. Queen takes c5, queen takes c5, d takes c5, rook d8 is mate. There's mate. Uh, no, but the queen is trapped. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. Holy shenan... Wait, what are... I must be miss... Does the queen really not have any squares? This is the match right here, everybody. This is... Ilya Nizhnik, who has been the MVP he... for the Webster Windmill, steps but into this... But he just this. blundered with Seven. rook to c7. On... Yep, rook c7, giving up the da square was the mistake, and now we see Ilya oh on Oh my gosh. He, he's struggling to come up with a move. He has to give up the queen. The queen he may guards have to play. f2. The Rook guards all of the third rank squares. The Atlantic Division, a group of teams defined by their star-studded rosters and historical significance. The St. Louis Archbishops, the division winners, led by the Super GM duo of Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So, will attempt to harness their all-star talent to fend off all challengers. The internationally flavored New York Marshals, led by Anton Demchenko, feel they can make history that would rival the chess club of their namesake. Laquang Liem's Webster Windmills are looking to equal the success of their university counterparts by blowing away the competition. And the attacking force that is the Montclair Sopranos, featuring young American star Sam Sevillon, are poised to make an offer the other teams can't refuse. It's the PCL playoffs, so anything that can happen, will happen. Tune in on March 19th as the drama kicks off, and go to ProChessLeague.com for more information. And we are live. I was scooted up really close there, apparently. With the 2019 Pro Chess League playoffs, it's the quarterfinals. With me here, the amazing Anna Rudolph. We are set to cover the matchup between the Webster Windmills and the St. Louis Archbishops. It's a battle for the entire city of St. Louis today, Anna. It is a battle. Welcome, everybody. This is already the quarterfinals of the Pro Chess League. I'm really hyped that today we will get to know two of the teams that will make it to San Francisco to the live finals. Yeah, and, you know, we, we joke that it's a, it's a battle for the, the city of St. Louis, but for those teams, for those who don't know, this is, this is a, really a battle of crosstown rivals here. 
Uh, many of these players are actually actively competing against each other, seeing each other every day currently at the U.S. Chess Championship. Uh, of course, the U.S. Championship on a rest day today, and that helps us see players like Grandmaster Ray Robson, as you see right there on board one for Webster. And then, of course, the two-headed monster that is Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So. They're rivals by day, but teammates by night, apparently, like Batman. <laughs> yes, they are. And we can say the same about Ray Robson and Wesley So. As far as I know, they used to be roommates at university. So we shall see now the two playing on two different teams. Well, let's take a look at our bracket here and remind everybody of who all eight teams are that are remaining. Uh, of course, our focus right here to start is, is going to be right there in the upper right corner where the St. Louis Archbishops barely squeaked by the Montclair Sopranos with an 8-8 victory. For those of you who, again, don't think the regular season matters, think again. Uh, and then, of course, Webster, also in a very close match, eliminated the other team from New York the greater New York area, and, and that's why we have the matchup that we do here between the one and seats, three seeds, excuse me, from the Atlantic Division. And as you as you look at both how both these teams got here, uh, were you more impressed by one over the other? Obviously, St. Louis on the on the scoreboard barely got by with a tie, but but they did what they had to do. Based on the form you saw from these players, who do you look at as maybe really hitting their stride at the right time between St. Louis and Webster? I think it's a little bit more difficult for the windmills for the fact that in 2017 we had the exact same scenario where the Archbishop moved on to the final four by playing 8-8 against the windmills and having draw odds. And today, once again, it is the team of the Archbishops that will move on in case of a tie. So the, so the windmills need at least eight and a half points and forgetting about their past. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> today, of course, St. Louis will have draw odds. So if it comes down to another 8-8 tie, then then again, we will see that one seed in the Atlantic really pay off. But as we uh, as we go back to looking at the pairings here, um, we look at Ray Robson facing off against Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So on boards one and two. And we know he's a young superstar, rising talent in the U.S., but... How do you think he feels, feeling like at some point he's got to work his way through two players that he's been spending a lot of time preparing for for the U.S. Championship? It must be difficult, but I think a player like Ray must be also very motivated whenever he faces Fabiano and Wesley. The three, they have played against each other already at the U.S. Championship. Ray made a draw both with Fabiano and Wesley, so maybe he will want to prove something more than just having half a point against those two monsters, legendary U.S. chess players. Well, I was going to say, or, or, or the other way to look at it, as long as he continues to hold serve, right? He's probably doing what more pe what uh, most people can't do, just holding holding serve against those two guys, Fabiano and Wesley So, and a lot of that may depend on uh, what color he has against e each specific opponent. Uh, we talk about uh, what's at stake and why these players are motivated. Let's remind everybody of what the prizes are here uh, for the for the entire league. We're now getting down to it where those teams remaining have been fighting their way through a grueling regular season, but uh, they can they can smell it. They, their eye is on the prize, and I think especially for a lot of these managers, uh, really would be vindication to, to make it to San Francisco, regardless of even where you finish, um, getting to the getting into the, the final four and and being at the, the live the live finale there. You've been there, Anna. It's, it's different than normal chess environments and something that really helps cel celebrate, if you will, the full team experience that the Pro Chess League is as compared to very individual over-the-board chess tournaments. It is an epic event. If you guys are near the Bay Area, California, you should make it to the finals. May the 4th and the 5th are the dates. Danny will be there. Robert will be there. Alexandra and I are also going. And we guys, you guys should be there. We will know today two of the teams that will make it to the semifinals. So either the Archbishops or the Windmills will qualify to this epic live esports event in San Francisco. And we, we do have information coming out where we can't reveal it yet in regards to uh, what the ticket prices will be and some of the different uh, packages available to fans uh, in order to, uh, to take part in that. If you're, if you're interested, just stay tuned to chess.com slash news and, and all the things that are the Pro Chess League. You can go to prochessleague.com. And on that note, let's remind everybody of all the ways they can stay in touch and stay involved with following the league when we aren't live. Uh, that, of course, is everywhere that content and social media exists on the web. Is that a fun way to say that you can follow us on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, 
the main website, and if you're on chess.com today and want to follow the games yourself, of course, uh, just use that command within the live server, and things... Uh, Things should be pretty easy for you to stay in touch with everything. And, of course, if you're looking to travel, sometimes people have to pack things when they travel. And, you know, a backpack is a way to consider doing that, traveling. A backpack. I would still need to get one of those backpacks. I really I'm going to have to bring a few because I have a few extra here um, at the office. So I'll, I'll bring a few just to make sure that we'll do, like, some random things where we stand on the balcony. And I want to get a T-shirt gun. Oh, can we get it? Can I get a T-shirt gun, please? Can I get a t-shirt gun for the for the event there? <laughs> I want a t-shirt gun. I, I just thought of that. I want a t-shirt gun. Where is the nearest like stadium where we can rent one, borrow one? Or steal one. I like how you're thinking. That's right. If we go in to the nearest the nearest sports stadium, do they do t-shirt guns in Europe, Anna? Is that, a, is that or is that just an American thing? Um, I think if you explain it, I have an idea, but I'm not exactly sure what does that stand for. Aren't... You know, I, I majored in petty theft in college. Okay, you did. <laughs> That's awesome because every time I've seen one of those t-shirt guns at any sporting event, I want one. And it is a it is a large cannon, Anna, out which prizes explode from, right? These prizes can be oh. – they can be a number of things. They can be shirts. They I, th I think mm. I've seen them put, like, socks in there, you know, like special, like, socks. Oh, I, I would love to see that. I thought it was like this mascot uh, that you have at many of the sporting events. We need a PCL events. mascot. <laughs> Everything she's saying is and just the like... Giving, the mascot giving out prizes. Can somebody dress up as a knight in a giant knight suit? <laughs> the Colts. Let's get them. I think they have, a, they have a mascot who's a giant horse, right? The Indianapolis Colts? Okay. Anyway, well, that got it. Brilliant ideas here as we are waiting for the games to begin between the Archbishops and the Windmills. Let us know in the chat, guys, what do you think about Danny's ideas? And if you will be there to witness it live, May the 4th and the 5th in San Francisco. And uh, May the 4th be with any of you traveling there. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm interested to see the chat. And thanks for thanks for reminding me, Anna, to take a look at the chat. Shout out to BJH. I see, I see you yourself in the chat, all of our subscribers there. Let's see what's going on yeah, in the chess TV chat. Thank you, Crazy Coffee Man, for the raid earlier. I didn't even see the raid. I'm sorry about that. Yes, you've been very busy discussing these innovative ideas on how to reform the already. I, very I'm I'm not joking about a t-shirt gun, by the way. <laughs> like I know I know people think like oh like I'm I'm literally not joking that we are going to have a t-shirt gun at the PCL finals and I'm going to shoot players while. I'm just gonna shoot a player with a T-shirt while while he or she is playing. I'm not kidding. It's happening. <laughs> um, shout out to Blue Wizard Grandmaster, always with us when the Atlantic throws down. Denise Boros, thanks for being here, man. Uh, Island of Change, Diamond member there. That's first of all, is it is it the island where Jack and Kate are? Like what is what is this island you speak of? I would like to go to there. Um, gold member Nutmeg Pro, and everybody in the Twitch chat. Um, I'm getting excited, Anna. So let's let's talk a little bit again. Actually, while we have time, we've got some pregame here. Thank you for the bits there. Let's go back to our bracket and talk a little bit, Anna. You and I have had the pleasure of doing nu doing numerous shows together uh, this year, and and I think we've probably covered every division at some point, right? The Central, uh, the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Eastern. Um, obviously. Uh, today we'll be focused on the Atlantic and the Pacific, but let's jump right across and talk about how the gnomes and the snowballs moved on. Uh, both, both in um, okay, final scoreboard kind of close, but having done the con, those neither of those were really um, nail biters. Um, led by York Meyer, the snowballs Meyer went four and zero. The the gnomes had a much more balanced attack. In fact, Hammer on board one only scored two and a half. So a very different way that they reached the quarterfinals. But as you look at the gnomes and the snowballs, Anna, give me give me your prediction on who you think the favorite is there. I think slightly better chances the gnomes should have. But once again, as you mentioned, it wasn't such an easy ride for neither of these teams to make it to this stage. So anything can happen. In the other match, the Blizzards and the Pandas, 
I'm expecting the pandas to move forward, even though I'm rooting for the blizzard. So my mind says one thing and my heart another. Hey, what do you think, Danny? Story of my life, right? Mind says one thing, heart says another. But no, the <laughs> um, the you know it, it'll be interesting. I think it's very hard to argue with Shangdu not being the favorite, despite them having the three seed, because. Um, for those of you who maybe missed last week, they won that match by three games over Dallas. Yes, the Destiny did not have Jeffrey Zhang on board one, but Yu Young Yi, who was on board one for the Pandas, scored a half a point out of four, and they still won the match by three games. So when you look at the powerhouse lineup they have, today they'll be sporting Ding Li Ren on board one. I think this is this is a really tough matchup for Minnesota, but... Um, like you, I'm a commentator, so I'm not supposed to have a rooting interest. Obviously, I also know the Minnesota Blizzard, and led by Mr. Scandy himself, Finzo905, um, John Bartholomew. So I wouldn't mind to see the Blizzard. Um, Shangdu was there last year, but but I'm going to have to give the nod uh, to the Pandas. And, and then we go to the last match that you and I haven't had a chance to discuss yet. The two, the, the two most dominant teams all year, Tbilisi and Armenia, have had the best records overall on uh, of any teams in any division, and only one of them will survive on April 2nd. Uh, who, do you, who do you like in that matchup? I think we are slightly biased in case of the Eagles, since uh, they brought us two suitcases full of souvenirs from Yerevan, Armenia. So I would love to see them one more time and see what they come up with as present. But apart from that, when we interviewed Artok and the team, they really thought that the gentlemen will be a tough match. They are, of course, the team that has scored the highest number of points in the entire league. So the gentlemen scored more points than any other club in the Process League 2019 season. So I think it's going to be a difficult match for the Eagles, but in terms of team spirit, I believe that the Armenian Eagles are one of the favorites in terms of how close they are as friends and they prepare together for the match. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It's hard for me to not feel a little bit of that, uh, the, the heartwarming feeling when you see Artok so happy and the Eagles celebrating because we, we saw that last year in San Francisco. But, uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, Tbilisi is... Tbilisi is a force to be reckoned with. I wouldn't mind seeing Jababa in San Francisco. Uh, Bedora, quite the character. And, uh, you know, they've been led by, as he as he pointed out, Ponsule and his wife are really the MVPs of that team uh, because they found the, the diamond in the rough and Nika Volkov, um, who's, who's just been way overperforming his, his rating on paper um, and uh, showing exactly what it's like to build a successful pro chess league team, you have to have an underrated board four that gives you, gives you the ability to sport a 2,700 like Jabob on board one, but not see such drop off on board four. So, um, you know, I have a hard time picking that one too. Um, I think that Tbilisi and Minnesota have one thing in their favor, which is the same thing St. Louis and Norway does, right? They have draw odds. Um, and so yes. if it comes down to eight, eight tie, then, uh, then they will, they will reap the benefits of their great regular season. Uh, speaking of reaping the benefits, I, I pointed out this t-shirt gun thing, Anna, and the chat has been going nuts. People are telling me that they're going to start donating bits. We already got somebody to donate bits for help for help us getting a t-shirt gun. Um, and people, if you want to send me a link, seriously, to my chess.com profile, I know what you're saying, Danny. You have 1,304 unread messages in your chess.com profile. <laughs> We're not falling for that trap again. But, but um, if you send it to... If you send a message to Anna, I think I'll, it'll get read. And um, because she only has two thousand seven hundred and thirty-one unread messages, you, so you're guilty too, right? So we need a link. I need a link for a rental. Obviously, appreciate the bits and the support. Anybody who ends up being live in San Francisco, you will see a T-shirt gun, and it will be branded with the Pro Chess League. We may just buy one. I don't know. I, I'm I'm nervous right now. I'm going to talk to my wife about it. I mean, I, I might just buy one for myself and start shooting stuff at the kids around the house. If they leave dirty laundry. We got we got more <laughs> bits there. Uh, if if they Probably leave dirty laundry, visual, I picture it already. <laughs> and if they leave dirty laundry in it, I'm gonna shoot it at them. I'm I'm get I'm getting a t-shirt gun for the house. So, um, and uh, I did do that, Aquaman. I did do that. Um, <laughs> but all right, we are uh, we are moments away. Not quite yet, but we are moments away. Um, Either way, this is this has already been a lot of fun. I'm I'm really amped. I think this is going to be a very very close match today. I think what you see on boards one and two for Carwana and so, you see the windmills making up for on board three with Ilya Nizhnik. The fact that the windmills have sported Ilya Nizhnik on board three in so many lineups this year, Anna, is just bananas to me. 
Um, it, it, yeah, it's a it huge is. reason it why is. they're and here. Thank you for the, the reference to my future emo, the Anna Banana. It is, it is on the way, guys. It is being designed by the chess.com team. And uh, congratulations to... Uh, congratulations. I was going to say no... <laughs> That I wanted to say thank you, Dre Dre eighty three forty seven for the bits. I think that goes to the fund for Danny to have this amazing idea for the Protest League finals. Well, Anna just what mentioned. Name, Anna? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that you will have the. I forgot the name. The, the we are collecting gun. for t-shirt gun. T-shirt yeah. gun. Um, that that's the one. If uh, if uh, if sorry, I got distracted by a comment in chat that I'm not going to read. Um. <laughs> Anybody who's wondering about emotes, Anna mentioned Anna Banana. You can also now use your emote of your favorite team. Uh, if you go ahead and click on the emotes here for subscribers at the Chess Channel, show us your love, show us the hype, tell us who you're rooting for, use the emote in chat, because guess what? We have liftoff. We now are officially throwing down in the quarterfinals. Guess what, everybody? The match has started. Here we go, right now. The first game that we're going to be witnessing is between Ilya Nezhnik, War 3 of the Windmills against War 2 of the Archbishops. Yep. That's Grandmaster Wesley So. So we've got a... Okay, I was going to say, are, are we going to go uh, some sort of double fee and kettle Grunfeld? We have a reverse Grunfeld if Black played D5. Um, but in this case, Wesley playing the move C5, we're likely to get just a traditional sort of G3 Kings Indian. Now, when I was a D4 player, I actually played this system as white against the Kings Indian consistently. Um, one of the one of the lines that can occur here, let's say if black gets castled and so does white, the move pawn to D6, knight C3, and then knight to C6 is often met by D5, knight A5, and then knight to D2, where white voluntarily retreats the knight to make sure that the C pawn is, is held together, and then white can kind of slowly expand over here while black plays for A6 and B5, sort of a King's Indian meets a Bononi plan. Um, this position has been played many times by grandmasters of the highest level, so uh, we'll see what theory they go for. No, okay, so Wesley decides to take on D4 Anna, transposing into what will be sort of a Boleslavsky hole, Maroxy bind kind of structure rather than the closed G3 Kings Indian I was just showing. Yeah, I think we will be witnessing the ideas that you mentioned, although, yeah, it depends on when Black takes on D4 and this Maroxy bind set up the double fianchetto possibly. Yep. And the other game that has just started, I'm looking at the opening on the other board between Josh Bloomer and Ray Robson, but it's going to take some time for this position to be more exciting. Is the Slav defense one of the most solid approaches? But, but a fast D4. approach right now by Bloomer, who's trying to trying to say at 1886, he's not intimidated by Ray Robson, right? We'll let him, we'll let him think that. We'll let him believe that. Um, but, okay, playing very quickly, we'll see how he deals with this move. Okay, bishop h5, this is the principal way to take advantage of any queen's pawn game, Anna, where the bishop develops from the light squares, right? Leaving the pawn on b7, very principal for white to come out and try to increase the pressure, but but this is all theory. Usually c5 is a move here, everybody, um, by Bloomer, and, and one of the... Although in this structure, it actually isn't as good because the bishop can take f3, right? Something like c5 takes f3 and then black can immediately strike with moves like e5 in the center that you don't normally get when the knight's on f3. So actually, the theory here, right now I think favoring Robson a little bit to avoid this move c5, and indeed Bloomer doesn't play it. Yes, and this is the game where the archbishops are the most vulnerable in the first round. You see that George Bloomer rated 1800, 1886 as his rating against board one of the windmills. That is a huge rating gap. It's over... Is that 700 rating points of a difference? It's a big rating difference. Um, a lot of people have a big rating difference when they throw down against Fabiana Caruana, and so does Joshua Grabinski. I just flipped to that board here where we have, speaking of theory being played very quickly, uh, Grabinski playing a G3. Actually started out with an H3 Nidorf, so could have been a very, very sharp uh, version of, of English attack style structures where White actually plays for G4 and ultimately castles long. But instead, uh, after e5, knight e2, h5, uh, Grabinski simply committed to to uh, kind of a standard standard approach here. Um, I I tend to feel a lot more comfortable in these positions as black. We know that along with Maxime Vache Le Grave, Fabian Caruana is kind of one of the world's leading experts in the Nidorf, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and certainly he wouldn't be going for this line if he didn't know the theory, and he still has more time than he started with at about 15 minutes, so... 
Yes, uh, Joshua is also playing very quickly. If we take into account that his opponent is the world number two, and maybe he is a little bit intimidated by the fact that his opponent is that strong, but he seems to be very well prepared for now. So, so one both of, players are making these moves very, very quickly. Yeah, still playing very quickly. What, one of the uh, positional advantages to what White did here with the knight d5 trade is if you get all these moves you you kind of fantasize about, c4, b4, a4, a5, and you've got some sort of huge pawn structure on the queen side, you eventually have a, a, a four on three majority here, right? Uh, four pawns versus c3 with breakthroughs like c5. The issue is that typically in this in this sort of structure, Black is also giving up the bishop pair sometimes with the bishop taking on d5. Here, the fact that Fabiano has kept that light square bishop and has a very straightforward plan. Queen to d7, put the battery on the h3 pawn, and then at some point, he'll probably be trying to, to expand on the on the king side, maybe even move the bishop to try to get something like f5. Makes me feel like this middle game is is typically more comfortable for Black than some of these knight or structures are. I agree with you, although the only drawback I can see in Black's setup is that his king will be vulnerable if white can open up the position. So I'm wondering if at some point white can push f4 and point out, yeah, well, <laughs> maybe not anymore. Black has castled kingside, but that's an interesting decision when the pawn is already on h5. Will that pawn become a target? Yeah, in a lot of these night orbs, it, it does eventually because especially here where white has just castled short, both kings on this side of the board, eventually it is a loose pawn. But I, I think that with the light square bishop on the board and, and his ability to keep bringing pressure over here, that pawn is much more likely to be an asset than a than a weakness down the road. But all right, so we'll, we'll keep our eye on it. Um, some of these other games are heating up. I think we should touch on the one we haven't really looked at yet between Alex Shimonov and Nicholas Thurduro. Um the queens are off the board here, Anna. You're an endgame expert, along with John Urschel. What do you think about this? So far, I like this position a lot because I can't blunder the queen, aka I can't play the Botus Gambit, as you guys know, here on Twitch. So both white and black have prevented Alexandra's favorite tool in chess. And I believe that white is better since uh, he's gaining more space on the queen side. And I think the knight position is also going to be more comfortable if white can jump quickly to c4, attack the d6 bishop, then develop the other knight as well. And the bishop can come to e3 or g5. So, so far, I would definitely pick white here. Yeah, I think, um, like you said, both queens off the board, less chance of, of a crazy game here, crazy blunders, but looks pretty looks pretty solid. I'm, uh, I'm also... I think liking white a little bit, um, but still still super equal. And uh, obviously, Shimonov, pretty strong player, certainly has played this position before. So what's the plan for either yeah. side? I think that one idea that Black might have is is whether he can move the knight from f6 and try for f5, um, whether he takes sort of a slow plan of, of b6 and then c5. But, but white also has this a5 move at some point, getting that rook on a1 in the game. So... Yeah, the more I look at yes, it, the more I agree be, with you. Yes, it's going to be a little difficult for Black to develop fully for the move that you have mentioned, that once he pushes b6, a5 is really unpleasant, and he can't really push further with b5 because that would weaken the c5 square. So I think right. I really like the knight on b3, and the other knight will go towards c4, putting pressure on the e5 pawn and simply then developing the bishop to e3. I think this is very comfortable for White, yeah. although it may not be much. I agree. Uh, it'll be, we'll see if he can get much. He obviously is the underrated uh, player in this matchup, that being Nicholas uh, Thodoro, as we see him right there playing live from the St. Louis Chess Club right there that is currently hosting the U.S. Championship and now hosting the Pro Chess League. So shout out to the St. Louis Chess Club for all their support for chess players and chess tournaments. Seriously, we uh, all chess professionals owe, owe the St. Louis Chess Club a great debt. These events are amazing to watch, and it's nice to see Nice to see players playing in our Pro Chess League from the venue. So um, let's go back to the only matchup that has Grandmaster on Grandmaster action this round. That's Nizhnik mm -hmm. versus So. And um, it's also the one that seems to be moving along uh, with the most speed. Um, we left Ooh, the position. That, it has changed a lot since we last looked at it. What? Yeah, I was going to say, it we left the position on move six with Knight no, takes d4. And we've seen a lot of... Uh, development here this move queen a5 and queen h5 is a pretty typical approach and this uh 
and this kind of hybrid G3 meroxybind structure because when the knight leaves F3, everybody, you're just dealing with a more a more vulnerable kingside. Now, this doesn't mean that Wesley is guaranteeing checkmate or anything, but the point is the queen hits H2, you've got the knight involved, and uh, the idea is that white, white is going to try to justify pressure on the queen side. Usually they play a move like C5 next. Actually, in fact, that's what he did. He played C5, and the whole point was to, to hold back the, the pawn structure here. So white gets this sort of queenside by an Anna in exchange for, for black feeling like he might eventually get some sort of attacking chances with that knight being gone. Um, your instincts, what do they tell you about who's gotten the better of it? I Given how quickly both players are playing, I feel like they both think their position is just fine. Um, obviously, Wesley has the isolated D6 pawn now, Anna, which which can't be good, and White Nizhnik also has the bishop pair. Um, but White's lacking a little yeah, bit of I development. Yeah, those are factors that I like a lot for White. At the same time, Black has the initiative. I feel like his pieces are more active. With the queen on h5, as you pointed out, putting pressure on the king side. And this rook may come to b6. It's an interesting rook lift, activating the a8 rook via this sixth rank, rook b6. And he has just played it. Yeah. I think he's compensating for the weaknesses in his position with dynamic play. I like rook b6. And, and like you said, uh, one way you compensate for the weaknesses is by putting pressure on your opponents, right? b2 is certainly something you want to spy with your little eye there. You've got a rook and a bishop on that open uh, that open diagonal there. And don't be surprised if black plays for d5 now at some point um, to maybe try to use the e4 square for the knight since g4 is no longer no longer on the docket. And I think for black, you've got this, you want to get center control and keep pressure with your pieces because if white gets going here with moves like bishop e3, gain a temp on the rook, and we've got two bishops, I don't know, it makes me makes me nervous what those two bishops might be capable of uh, in, in an end game if you're, if you're Wesley so. Yes, I agree. So we shall see how Wesley will want to get out of this. It is a game where he will need to be defending, so I'm guessing that he will have to find an active way to create counterplay before it's too late with this d6 weak pawn, yes. Yeah. Well, speaking of needing counterplay before it's too late, uh, Bloomer is is all in on the king's side here, trying to compensate for Black getting the open file. Um now Robson plays h5, so I guess he's not too worried about f5, given that bishop h7 will will uh, will leave the e5 pawn hanging. One of the things I think to point out for 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 players uh, maybe who didn't quite understand why the tension of the queens was so important here, um, I think uh, beginner players, amateur players tend to value their queen even more, right? Don't want to don't want to trade her, mm -hmm. and the reason both these players kind of engaged in this little staring contest is because neither side really wanted to trade. And, and open up the other person's A file as long as there was there were these two rooks sitting on it potentially that will just become open and target the opponent's pawn. But once White kind of committed and moved away, I think that Bloomer said, you know, I'm no longer interested in him trading here and opening my rook, so I'm going to go ahead and, and submit and take. But the problem with that trade, and I think the reason it makes Ray happy is this is a very vulnerable queenside. Don't don't take for granted that just because the queens are off the board, right, Anna, it doesn't mean that black isn't better. The A pawn is under fire, and black is going to play for B5 and B4. And it's very difficult for white to deal with this sort of plan, which is why we see in the live position uh, Bloomer being kind of all in on the king side. Yes, I really like this position for black with the semi-open A file and the, the plan that you have pointed out, B5, B4. Also, the knight can jump in on the live square, knight C5, to then play knight to D3 or knight to E4. So I don't think that Bloomer has done well, and it's going to be very difficult for him to survive this position against Ray Robson with almost 700 rating points as a difference. And speaking of big rating difference, Fabiano Caruana's position must be winning already. He is a pawn up, and he is attacking against Joshua Grabinski. Yeah, and so we left this one. Where did we leave this one? Somewhere back in uh, the debate after the bishop on f5 and whether... whether uh... The h5 pawn would be weak for black, but I guess as as we kind of thought, the the tempo gained and then eliminating these light square bishops. Yeah, uh, this is this is a really really instructive game here by Fabian. Honestly, if you're if you're a knight or player out there 
wondering exactly how you you play this variation. Look how he uses the H pawn to his advantage. Advana, uh, Advana. Your name's not Advana. Your name's Anna. Anna Banana. Uh, yeah, that's Ad, my new Advana, name. Advana, <laughs> and you sing a song Havana. That, this is just you know it's it's uh, um, but this move H four, right? Anna just aggressively just destroying White's king side here, uh, opening things up. Really instructive stuff to see how to play the Night Orf is black. I'm taking notes. Literally, I'm a Night Orf player, and it, whenever guys like Fabiano or MVL play your opening, you, you take notes at, at just the little things they do and, and how well they execute plans that you see all the time in books, but then you see players do it at the highest level. Yes, and this was very crucial that he managed to get the d5 point. And now with queen b5, he's simply offering to enter an endgame. It makes perfect sense when you're a pawn up and you have a protected pass pawn on e4. Yeah, and he's still just playing super fast. Obviously, he's supposed to get this game. You want you want Fabiano uh, to definitely get a win here if you're the Bishops, uh, considering that Wesley So is engaged in a GM-on-GM -GM battle. Uh, this is Fabiano's game as the top board to make sure he gets. Uh, Grabinski makes an interesting decision here. Look, he's saying, I'll trade you my A pawn for your D pawn. How you like them, Apples? I think Fabiano's going to play Bishop E7, actually. My instincts say he's going to save, or Rook A6. I think he's going to mm -hmm. not take the trade, and then he's going to try to bring his king from f7 to e6 so that he can keep the two passers. So are we betting on that, or you you agree with me that he's probably going to keep the d6 pawn instead of trading the a pawn for the d6 pawn? This time I would agree with you, because the e and d pawns together can be extremely strong. So he goes for rook a6, yeah. you were right, Danny, with your analysis. And we can see the world number two on camera. He's he must be at home, I assume. Yeah, Fabiano has an apartment not in St. Louis. Um, not always just hosting parties there. You know, big party guy. Um, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes confusing in the process from his home. And just one more time to mention that Fabiano, Wesley, and Ray Robson, the three of them are are using their free day at the U.S. Championship yep. to compete in the Pro Chess League, which is great. Of course, dedication to their team. And now that he's put the rook on a6, as we said, everybody, I think he'll play g6 now. And, and the problem is that Grabinski has no way to deal with this king f7, king e6 plan, right? Rook d5 maybe threatens to play a5 and guard the pawn, but it's all kind of temporary as soon as Fabi activates his king. So um, let's uh, let's get... <laughs> That's a good comment by Perpetual Stalemate. Isn't he the guy that appeared on the chess bra streams? Glad to see he made GM. Yeah, exactly. He's just some random GM. No big deal, right? Um, no big deal at all, yeah. But uh, The Chess Bros, unfortunately, now that we are talking about the Chess Bros, they didn't make it to the playoffs, but next year they will try again, we are sure. They got lots of fans here among you guys, and uh, it's a pity that they can't make it to the finals. But one of these teams, the Archbishops and the Windmills, will be there in San Francisco on May the 4th and the 5th. Yep. And uh, Ender, your comment, no giant chess. I'm not in St. Louis right now, but uh, if if I visit the Singfield Cup again, Maxime and I, that's MVL. We have a date for an MVL versus Danny Wrench giant chess rematch, so it will happen. Um, shout out to all the Twitch Prime subs coming in. We haven't shouted out everybody, but Queenside Attack right there, everybody giving us their Twitch Prime love. We appreciate it. Um, Thank you so much for the support. And remember that we are collecting for that T-shirt gun that Dan is dreaming of for the Pro Chess League Finals. No, we're going to get the gun no matter what. We always appreciate the support. <laughs> Any bits that want to go don't to tell that. Them not to donate, Danny, I don't want them I'm to feel like they have to, to donate it. bits to get the gun. Like, I'm already telling my wife, like, I want a T-shirt gun. Like, I just want to own one. It's I, I need it. I need it now. Um, Shout out to Eric Hansen, the Chess Rush, just joining us here. We have talked about the Chess Rush just a minute ago and what a pit is that they couldn't make it to the playoffs but next year they will be back yep and you guys can root for them one more time your favorite teams probably so fabi has uh gone for this initiative here he ultimately did trade the a pawn for something but instead of the d6 pawn it was the f pawn which is not a bad idea right because that ended up uh keeping the d and e pawns together which are ultimately going to be two passers that help him help him win this one so let's jump back to this one quickly to show how ray robson is demonstrating the correct way to play this structure as we said i think it's instructive for a lot of members to see why this why this queen trade is good to open up the a file and and create this opportunity to gain space i think there's two things there that um i, I keep wanting to use the word young but it's not necessarily young kid it's it's <laughs> It's developing chess players struggle with. They don't like trading queens and they don't like doubling pawns, but those are things that you should be aware of as uh, always have exceptions here. And in this case, opening the rook and this b4, b5 plan 
It's just really clear and straightforward for Black, and it's why I, I really don't like that Bloomer made that decision. Um, and uh, I think the middle game it is a middle game, even though the queens are gone. It's just much better for Black now with this dominance of the light squares, as you said, Anna, and uh, and very nice space on the queen side. So. Yes, I like it a lot. And B4 can come in the future to get rid of the double the B pawns and open up the A file. So definitely, a Josh Bloomer uh, has a very difficult position to defend. And adding to that the 700 rating point difference, I would say that in this game, the Archbishops are going down. Plus he's, now on the other board... I was, I was going to say, plus he's going up against a vegan. And you know how hard it is to play <laughs> against a vegan. So... Is it? <laughs> I, I was just making a vegan joke because they're better than all of us. But vegans, uh, you know, I'm sure he feels good. Like, I'm sure his digestive energy, energy, his level of energies are high, you know. But um, but Ray, Ray Robson is That's a vegan. True. That is a confirmed fact, yeah. Oh, I did not know that yeah. Ray Robson is a vegan. That's, now, you have told me something about Ray. And, of course, a healthy diet is important in chess. All the top players take care of their diet and they all practice sports. It's important to be fit for chess. It is. Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the vegan gambit. <laughs> the vegan gambit. Um, we keep the comments coming in the chat, guys. Of course, we are reading it even if we cannot type in the chat because it's a little bit difficult to multitask, but we pay attention to what you guys are saying. And we appreciate that you are here with us for the quarterfinals of the Pro Chess League. Yep. And all right, so let, let's talk about this. Arguably the most critical matchup on paper this this round and uh, is, is the one here between Nijnik and So. And part of the reason we say that, everybody, is if you're not familiar with the format, is it's an all-play, all-format. It's a Shevin style where everybody will play everybody. And so if you assume that people will do what they're supposed to do against their higher or lower rated opponents, that when you get in those almost kind of coin flip matchups where you get GM versus GM, that's when... That's when when the pendulum actually has the ability to swing either way, you really pay close attention because even if it doesn't seem like much now, maybe we move after this round, Anna, and the score is still tied or, or, or one team is winning. But whoever starts to win those closing, close in rating matches tends to be the one in the driver's seat toward the end. So, um, wow, Rook C2 is quickly met by Bishop B2, and I'm wondering if Wesley So is on the verge of losing back Losing, actually not losing back, yes, losing some material uh, straight this up. This is problematic because uh, White is threatening to take the knight yep. and then the rook. And if rook takes b2, which must have been the idea of Wesley, isn't it just bishop to c3 and the same problems? Yeah, the rook could um, still go to a2. Note you can't take e2, everybody, because then bishop takes b4 and the queen is overwhelmed in her duties. But if rook a2, queen b3, and one more time, I'm threatening to take the knight and the rook. Yeah, uh, Bishop D2 played, I feel like, is just going to chase that rook back to his home. Nizhnik, uh coming to us live from the well-known Webster headquarters where a young man, he caught a very much-needed nap uh, many, many moons ago. <laughs> For those of you who know, Can that is the same. Can we get the link to that viral clip? Can we get the link in the chat to the viral clip? That is, that is the, the headquarters of where people sleep. That's the headquarters of where people sleep. Um, for the Webster windmills. <laughs> no, but jokes aside, I think Bishop E2 played very quickly by Nizhnik is just going to scare Wesley home with this rook, and he's going to regret that. The problem is, if he if he goes anywhere but C7, then when the queen comes to B3, hitting the knight, and B7, you would actually lose a pawn. And I, I was actually trying to draw that line of the board, and Wesley literally played rook C7, so it's, it looked like it sort of stole the rook out of my hand. Um so Wesley makes the right decision, as I was saying, everybody. I think if the rook had gone anywhere else, you would have seen queen to b3. And then the b7 pawn is is under target. So um, I think rook c2 was just a blunder by Wesley. And if you look at the tempo of this game here, Nizhnik, despite being the underdog, is is up a little bit on time and also seems to be a little bit better. The bishop pair more and more is kind of paying off for white in this open position where black has this weak d5 pawn. What do you think? Yes, I think he must have missed the idea that there was no rook takes b2 after yeah. bishop d2 because this was just a loss of a tempo, an important one because the bishop will be very comfortable on c3 and it's already putting pressure on the b4 knight. So I think white is very comfortable with his pair of bishops, better pawn structure. Everything that we mentioned for white as a plus in the position is still there, but black's initiative is disappearing. Yep. 
I, I, I agree. Let's uh, let's pay close attention to this one again. We know St. Louis is the favorite, everybody. They they have draw odds. They are the overall one seed, and they have two of the biggest names in the league, Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So. But, but on paper, this is a matchup that I think really does pose some problems for them. That, that three GM lineup that the Webster Windmills bring, um, this is already an early sign. Because from my perspective, even if Nizhnik draws so, that's not a a bad result for the windmills, let alone if he actually converts this. Because if we look at Fabiano's game right now, everybody, he is uh, completely winning here in the live position. He's just, let's just say this one's over. Ray Robson, the board won respectively for uh, the windmills, also also on, ver uh, on, on the road to getting a win. So these two, three games, right? The Nizhnik So game, and then let's check on the Shimanov game versus uh, Th Thoduro. Theoduro. The, I, I keep wanting to say just Thurduro, like he's a thoroughbred, you know. He could be. He could be a thoroughbred. Nicolas Theodoro with the white pieces Theodoro. against Shimano. This seems to be more balanced than the other boards. Yep. At least I can't tell their result just yet. But I still like White's position a lot with the Knights on C4 and B4. White controlling the D5. And Black is still struggling to finish development because he cannot develop the B8 Knight with the C6 vulnerable pawn. And if you push that pawn, that weakens the d5 and b5 squares. Shout out to Greg, Shiha Greg Shahadi with the painful and cringeworthy puns in the Twitch chat. That's usually my job, buddy. <laughs> Shout out to the Proches League Commissioner. But I really also, appreciate guys, you taking Greg. that one. <laughs> help, help Greg out as usual. He's requesting some suggestions on what he shall order for dinner this time. And no donuts, I, Is that as true? far we as I see. Greg, I cannot believe it. <laughs> so apparently, the Theodoro is a thoroughbred. I mean, that's not bad. Two hundred twenty-five. Okay. What? Okay. All right. So there we go. He could bench me. <laughs> exactly. Um. So the same. The same. Same. For <laughs> uh, all right. Well. Anyway. So Theo Theodoro is. Um, He's gonna have to bench press, uh, bench press Shimanov. All right. I mean, this is this is still an equal game. But again, if if you just look at the the confidence that he's playing with, uh, he's also mm -hmm. up on time. This is this is where the coin flips the other way, right? If we're saying that Nizhnik is sort of um, outperforming his expected result, maybe if he gets a good result against So, if if Theodoro does it for St. Louis, then they're right back at it, right? Because because clearly. Um, the white player here is definitely underrated, right, compared to the black pieces. So he's he's more almost a hundred points underrated. Yes, true, and he's got a better position. And the same case is in Nizhnik's game, as you mentioned. I wonder if it's gonna peter out to a draw. Although white is still a pawn up, it's just that black has managed to to trade a couple of pawns, but uh, Nizhnik has this A pass pawn, which can be really problematic. How do you stop that pawn if now he goes A5? I don't know. I, I, I really think that Nizhnik is going to get this one. I think he's played fantastic uh, from start to finish. We just saw the young man on camera there from the Webster headquarters, but Ilya is a very strong grandmaster. For those of you who don't know, I mean, he's uh, not as well known, obviously, as big names like Carbon and So, but that's partly because he's also been pursuing his studies at Webster, right? He hasn't been playing as prof as active uh, as a professional player, but Nizhnik is a super talented chess player, so um, don't be surprised yeah. about this result. And look who is in the chat at this game between Nizhnik and Wesley. So it is none other than world number two, Fabiano Caruana. He's saying that this is far from over. Any result is possible with two minutes on the clock. True. And, wow. and you again, you love you love the team spirit, right? Fabi hanging out, cheering on his boy. He's saying White should be winning. Again, if you're not okay. <laughs> if you're not in the chess.com live <laughs> server, you're not seeing the chat we're talking about. We know there's many chat rooms to choose from whenever you watch a chess.com event and uh, to, to each his and her own. Um, but if you are on chess.com, then uh, then, uh, then, yeah, we we've also got somebody who's on camera proctoring, who's a well-known face to the Twitch community, and 
probably didn't even know we were going to throw him up. Oh, there he knows. He knows because oh, he's watching the there show. You go. He must be. He must be seeing himself live right now. Shout out to Eric Rosen. <laughs> Shout out to Eric Rosen. A great Twitch channel. Go his go follow Eric Rosen's channel on Twitch. He's also proctoring the match uh, for the for the Webster Windmills and for the league. He's there as kind of an observer of just uh, making sure things are going well. Um, uh, Eric, uh, raise the roof for us if you can hear me. Raise the roof. Raise the roof. Do you know do you know how to raise the roof? Uh Eric, give me a thumbs up. Eric, if the Eric, if they're hol Eric, if they're holding you against your will, blink twice. If they're holding you against your will, blink blink twice. Okay. Somebody get Eric some help. <laughs> All right. All right. Shout out to Eric Rosen. Um for those of you who saw the scoreboard go up by one point for St. Louis, that's indeed because Fabiana Carwana delivered a checkmate. With the queen on H1, right? We love checkmates around here. Good job for Fabi. Uh, Ray Robson, not close to checkmate, but is much better here. Um, although, shout out to Bloomer, who seems to have played a pretty solid game overall. I, I, I'm just been kind of expecting Ray to continue to grind this one out, which he is. And, and when this trade happens here, you're going to see a whole lot of pawns falling without a lot of time there for, for Bloomer to, to defend them. But but still, but it's quite a quite a good game as you mentioned. Yeah. It's such a big difference in strength to, yep. to hold it onto an end game like this. It wasn't such an easy game for Ray Robson. Yep. Well, uh, as we look for someone to rescue Eric Rosen, um, we also will check on uh, back to the the biggest game of the round: Nizhnik versus So. Um, as Fabiano said, hanging out in the in the chess uh, chess dot com live game chat. This is still a game that could go either way, and and uh, I, I I mean it's partly wishful thinking. I think he's cheering for his teammate, but the one thing that really supports his argument is that the the tactics here may be hard for Nizhnik to figure out with less than a minute. Fabiano pointing out that rook takes g3 doesn't work. Um, if rook takes g3, pawn takes, knight takes g3, king h2. I think the whole point is that a move like queen e5, uh, trying to put the discovery here on the king and make it hard might just be met by a move like rook f4 which is a double attack or, or say a double purpose move it stops the discovery and threatens to win the bishop on d4 so um i think that may be the line i don't have an engine in front oh but wesley goes for it yeah, rook takes g3 he's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna put to mine say. and fabi's analysis to the test i think that queen e5 is met by rook f4 so i don't think this works Okay, I think Queen E4... Okay, so far this is the line I thought. I think Rook F4 is the move, but again, I don't have any any analysis in front of me. Somebody now suggesting the count. That's Christian Carrilla. We got a lot of strong players just hanging out with us. He said Rook F4 was, should have been met by Bishop E3 from Black. I don't think so, Christian, because Queen D8 was on the table. Oh, look at that. Nizhnik with the defensive queen he's, sacrifice. He's giving up his queen. This is... This is insane because if rook takes d4, queen e5 oh, picks up the rook. Nizhnik must have missed that. I think he if, did. If, queen, if, if rook takes d4, queen e5, everybody, and Wesley might actually be about to save this game. He hasn't. Yeah, coming back from a worse position, now he is willing. He hasn't moved in an hour. Fun fact, he's also being painted right now. Oh, okay, there, he finally moved. I was just going to say, fun fact, <laughs> he's also being painted by a live. Uh, what are those people called that paint people? Artists? I no <laughs> Painters? I don't know. Okay, Wesley being painted as a Thinker Man statue right now. Um, but wow, look at Wesley I'm swindle say this one. Do with a panic move. Oh wow, this is incredible. Wesley coming back from an. Now, now he just has Queen G1 and now. Queen F2. Oh, he, he had Queen G1. Game over. This also looks me, like bro. it works. He can swing two the queen to left. g5 if he wants. And now bishop e2. I don't think he will repeat, though. King g7. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm super impressed with Wesley's play here. And again, Fabiano gets credit for pointing out the key reason why this game wasn't over was because of the time pressure, right? He said it earlier that with this much time on the clock, anything could still happen. And indeed, um, now with that very crushing move, Bishop d6 pinning the knight, Queen g1 wins the rook, and it's all over but the crying. Uh, Nizhnik resigns. Wow. What a huge win there from Wesley So, who quickly stands up to take a break. Although, not, not an although. In fact, not only does Wesley So win, but 
Theodoru also won that game as we were saying he was outplaying Shimonov. He hmm. he completely crashes through here on the queen side. Uh, very nice tactic started with this move. Uh, knight to b4 heading into c6. Bishop f7 actually blundered the move knight c6 check on move 32, Anna. Because if the knight took it, then, yeah. then rook takes oh, d7. But the position was already difficult for Black, yeah. so he was he was being outplayed. Nicolas Teodoro did a very good job getting that third point for the Archbishop. It's 3-0, and the only game where the Windmills have scored is their board one, Ray Robson, against board four of the Archbishops. Yeah. This has been an epic round for the Archbishops. It could have been 2-2, but then Wesley turned the tables. Yeah. No, the way the games were headed, uh, a lot, a lot of thing. It seemed like we might be headed for a two-two round, and one that was kind of a two-two, but a secret victory for the windmills. I think with Nizhnik, if he was able to get a victory as white, but look at Wesley playing this rook takes g3 tactic. Despite everybody saying, and by everybody I mean guys like Fabiano Caruana, myself, were sort of saying it shouldn't work. But what was the refutation then? Takes, knight takes, king h2, queen e5, Anna. He played rook f4, which is what I thought was right. And after knight e2, he sacked his queen. Perhaps there was another option here instead of sacrificing his queen. Um, but I don't know what it was. And again, I don't have an engine in front of me. Where where was Nizhnik supposed yeah, to improve? It's difficult to know without an engine, but the, the position, it's true that with just a few seconds on the clock, even if this was not such an objectively good yep. sacrifice, Wesley found the best practical way to continue the game, and it, it actually paid out for him, his sacrifice and being brave to go for it. No, you make a good point, regardless of whether it was a, a perfectly uh, calculated scientifically the best move it was a practical decision and, and an accurate one really because Nizhnik clearly could not figure out what to do against this move knight to e2 everybody and I can't figure it out right now um so uh, just a really really well-timed sacrifice maybe maybe rook f4 wasn't totally necessary but but the reason queen f4 doesn't work everybody is because then the knight can take f1 with check and the lady just falls for free so um, again, rather than trying to figure it out, I'm just going to tip my hat and say congratulations to Wesley So and the St. Louis Archbishops for starting off with a uh, an epic an epic performance here in the first four four game set. They have taken a three to one lead, and uh, there's plenty more of chess plenty more chess to come in this match. But right now, the bishops looking good. Speaking of more chess to come, Anna, let's remind everybody of the full Pro Chess League schedule. Uh, for those of you mm -hmm. who are now regretting your life that you didn't watch every single one of those shows starting back on January 8th, um, you should. Take a good hard look in the mirror and ask yourself, what were you doing with your life at that time? Indeed, what were you doing? And now head on to the YouTube channel of Chess.com and watch the replays. Also here on Twitch, you can find the latest videos, so make sure to dedicate 20 hours a day to replaying all the action from 10 weeks of regular season and then the playoffs. So much time has passed since we began, Danny. And uh, as you said, the playoffs uh, continue not only today, but then on April 2nd. And then, of course, we will have the live finale in San Francisco. Shout out to Tommy, Tommy Shelby throwing emotes from my channel and someone else's channel. Who? Where are those Fabi emotes from? Those are from the Chess Bra um, channel. Chess so bra emote, I would that's say. a great yeah, combination of chess emotes, bra. Chess Bra, and my personal channel, which is where you can get a Fabiano Caruana saying "Not in my house." That's a Dikembe Mutombo waving, waving that finger, saying <laughs> "Not in my house." So, <laughs> not my house. I love it, guys. Show us your favorite emotes. If we are already talking about emote games, while we are waiting for the next games to begin, I would love to see first of all which team are you rooting for? Is it the Archbishops or the Windmills? And which are some of your favorite emotes? Look at Grandmaster Jonaldvik Hammer, the captain of the Norway Gnomes. Of course, that's the logo of the Norwegian team. I, I think and you just some... inspired an impromptu emote mode only. Full emote mode. Look at that. Oh, Ooh, not quite. Emote mode. But <laughs> uh, yeah, show requested. us your emotes. We haven't done that in a while. Show us your emotes only, right? Let's go emote mode. Um, I like but it. But okay, the bishops like... The bishops getting a lot of emote spamming here as they as they deservedly should be getting. Now up three to one. And in the second round of play, let's talk about what those pairings will be. So uh, Ray Robson on board one moves on to play Nicholas Theodoro, uh, the the man who just came up with a huge victory over the higher rated Shimonov. Um, 
and uh, Carwana will take on Nizhnik, right? So uh, a much, much different opponent. But Wesley So just beat Ilya Nizhnik with the black pieces. So Carwana hoping to kind of double down on that success and, and really, really help put this one away. Yes, it must be difficult right now, this moment for Ilya Nizhnik to forget that he had such a good position against Wesley So He spoiled it. And it's not just that he couldn't win it. Normally, if you have an advantage, the worst that can happen to you is that you make a draw. Yep. But no, he lost the full point, and that's really painful. Anna, are, Anna and I are in one room in spirit, okay? Um, but uh, We are. Can't you see? We it, are yeah, just it's, uh, banging I try not shoulders. to show that I'm going to get cut off if I try to enter into the room. I, <laughs> I don't want to get cut off. No, it's just... I cut my arm off. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the next round of games has begun, and um, we have Ray Robson starting things off here against Nicholas Theodoro, an E4, E5 game. Rui Lopez with a Berlin, a denied Berlin, as I like to say it. This, that's a Dikembe Mutombo to the Berlin. That's a good IMO, like no, no Berlin. Rather than playing the mainline Berlin, everybody with castles and knight takes E4. The variation that has become much more popular, I think, at the highest levels is D3, mainly because of its flexibility, right? And it just avoids these roads where people know theory out to move 35, right? D3 just creates a much more flexible game, you get kind of an Italian pawn structure here with white playing for c3 and d4, and there's just a lot of flexibility in this position. I agree with you. I really like this setup, the d3 variation against mainly any of the Rui Lopez. You can play d3, and it leads to these kind of Italian slash Rui Lopez with d3 positions. Now that white has pushed d4 and black went back to d6, it's interesting how... The game will continue after bishop g5 because the queen only had one square, that is e8. You don't want to play bishop e7 because what black has for the worst pawn structure is the pair of bishops. So he is not aiming to trade it with bishop to e7. Yeah, and he's he's playing quickly, playing confidently, and, and, and honestly kind of needs to, I guess, to back up his words, as we can see on camera right now. When Nicholas was asked who the archbishop's biggest rival was, he said, nobody, because we're the best. I would say... <laughs> it's like it's like being asked in an interview, what's your biggest weakness? And you say, I have the biggest weakness I have is I have no weaknesses. Um, that's kind of like what that's the answer is there. That's I don't know that that always inspires a lot of uh, that's like billet, uh, bulletin board material. But anyway, we'll see if he can back it up. Obviously, he started off very well with a win against Shimonov. Speaking of which, Alex Shimonov is now underway against Josh Bloomer. Yeah, let's have a look at that game as well. So it was. One knight f3 and g3 bishop g2, which can lead to many openings still. This setup, it can transpose to normal d4 openings or an English opening if white does not push d4, but d3 instead or b3. Yeah, I I always get nervous about these systems uh, for black with the bishop being out here because I always, I always spy the queen b3 stuff. But I guess as Ray Robson taught us last game, not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Black can just meet queen b3 with queen b6 and, and uh, you know, don't worry about it, as they say. But, uh, yeah. But yeah, that's one of the critical lines that Danny has mentioned. Since the bishop is not defending the b7 pawn, the main question always in these lines is how do you protect the b7 pawn if queen b3 comes? And queen c7 normally is not a good idea if white can play bishop f4 soon or bring the rook to the c5. Right. That's why queen b3, queen b6 is the main response. Right. But um, here, I guess, Shimonov trying to think about the move order he prefers to move forward. The advantage of the knight being on d7 whenever you put the bishop on g4 is it avoids avoids the tempi of things like knight e5, which would both hit the bishop and open up more pressure against the center pawns here. So that's kind of a common tactic that if I just if I was to say this exact same position was on the board, but the knight was on b8 and black had the other knight on f6, you'd be looking at moves like knight e5 here. And so uh, in, this, in this move order, without that kind of straightforward plan uh, to deal with the bishop on g4, I think Shimonov is deciding... Whether probably he wants to play for like a B3 type system, kind of the ready double fianchetto you can go for here. Um, or you can castle and maintain the flexibility of keeping things like the queen B3 option open. So, so okay, we'll see what he chooses. I feel like as we jump to Wesley So's game, who's already made more moves than both the other boards combined, Wesley plays faster than like any other Super GM in the Pro Chess League. Am I, is that, am I right about that? Or is that just how it feels watching his games? But he just... 
He's always playing opening prep, like doesn't shy away from the way he, uh, he approaches these games the same way he does over the board games. I rarely see him playing some sort of obscure sideline, and that's probably why he can play so fast, because he's like, I'm just going to play the, the stuff that I know best. Yeah, he's really quick, and considering that sometimes he's multitasking and he writes in the chat during his games, just so that he can make some comment on the rest of the boards as well for his teammates, cheer for them. It is incredible to see that he can be this quick. And what a quote by Wesley So is his brother's non-chest achievement. <laughs> a lot of people commenting on that on that quote in the chat, and he's almost raising his eyebrows at himself. Be jealous, <laughs> right? It's like a, it's like a, I don't even. It's like I also like to live dangerously. It's like be jealous, you know. Um, anyway, well, uh, I'm I'm a little jealous right now of, of Wesley and and the high level chess he can play, but that's you know. That's a, that's a different story. Um, yes, they are playing one of the main lines of the open Catalan. So an open Catalan is when black takes on c4 and does not push c6. So he opens up the long diagonal on purpose for the idea that at some point he will aim to push c5 himself and equ uh, equalize the position. It's not that simple, of course. If, if it was that easy, everybody would play this line as black. But bishop b7, bishop c6 is one of the main setups. And then bishop d6 to trade that f4, bishop. Yep. White has more space. And this doubled f-pawn is not really weak. It actually helps white to attack on the king side later, having the semi-open g5. How do you like these positions, Danny, with the white pieces? I... Well, I, I like Joshua Grabinski's quote. He knows how to knit. That's a useful skill. What? <laughs> I want that guy wow. on my zombie apocalypse team. One of the things that you should always be doing if you aren't doing this in your life is gathering people for your zombie apocalypse team and knitting, keeping us warm with clothes. Very important skill. Joshua Grabinski just joined Danny Wrench's zombie apocalypse team. Um the uh, I, I like these. I love that you have a lineup already. Like, who would be the chess players that you take with yourself to a desert island or a zombie? Well, you account? know, not all chess players would make my team. Believe it or not, playing chess is not a skill I'm always looking for in the zombie apocalypse. It's not. It's not at the top of my list, but it it, it is. It's there. It's in the it's in the re, we're rebuilding society priority list where I want some smart people to help us, you know, develop game theory and think ahead a little bit. But overall. You know, a little more practical skills. Anyway, um, Karwana and Nizhnik, uh, speaking of practical skills, are playing even faster than Wesley So. Look at this. They are they are way deep in a French defense here. Shout out to, to JJ Chess, Last Seven Samurai, who, as he said, now he's rooting for White in the French. He switched sides, Anna, after our match. Did you hear about that? He switched sides? He switched sides. No, I didn't hear that. What happened in the match? Um, I'm gonna let chat tell you what happened in the match, but let's just say that if you Tarantino this and you already know the ending, which is that he switched sides, you might know who won the match. No way. No, I was in way. Denmark. I missed the action. No. <laughs> uh, it'll be on. It'll be on YouTube soon. Um, anyway, but let's talk a little bit about the French. Jokes aside, here, Anna, we've um, we've got a classical French. Um, the Steinitz variation. This is the variation that uh, JJ actually said he wanted to play a lot with me that I kind of refused to go down. But here we're going to see what mm -hmm. Fabiano comes up with because this is all theory. All theory. Bishop d3, b4. And now it gets a little bit less known with bishop takes c5 if I know this stuff correctly. And But now knight a4, bishop a7. Actually, we're probably still in pretty well-known roads here, right? For a, for a French player. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. and also JJ saying that this is the line he wanted. And honestly, black is okay. That's what JJ is saying now in the chat. I like these positions for black. I think it's uh, it's a really exciting middle game with the positions that, of course, oftentimes you see that when you castle opposite flanks, black will now be attacking on the queen side and white is aiming to give mate on the king side. So all these positions are very rich, whether it's the French defense or any other opening where you castle opposite flanks. Yep. No, agreed totally. And now Black has to watch out for the very easy move for the players at this level, but still a threat to be aware of. Queen e2 is spying the idea of the Greek gift, so just to show the instructive tactic for all of our members, if Black plays something like even Queen a5, an aggressive move, hitting the knight, trying to attack on the queen side, uh, Black would be losing on the spot to bishop takes h7, king takes h7, and knight g5 check. And uh, this kind of idea where the mating net just runs away from black is exactly what you want to avoid um 
when playing these types of uh, closed center positions with kings on opposite sides of the board. So, um, okay. Of course, Nizhnik plays the move f5. We now see him on camera. He's not going to fall for a Greek gift, but but Fabi's not going to give up that easily. He's trying to go all in here, do everything he can to open up tactics against the king. Doesn't this make people not want to play the French, Anna? I mean, explain yourself. I don't understand. How do we not love Fabiano to win this game? I think black is okay. <laughs> what is wrong with black's position? It's just, it's just. I just don't. I just feel like you can set your goals higher. That's all. I just don't understand why it's okay to just be like, you know, hoping not to get checkmated. That's all. Ninety-seven is a very important move. Black <laughs> is making sure that after G takes F five, he can take back with the knight, and in case of Bishop takes F five, Rook takes F five, everything is under control. And at the same time, he will continue his attack on the queen side. Queen a5 is problematic for white or bishop d7 because the knight doesn't have squares. Okay, spoken like a French pro. No, I I don't want to, I don't want the <laughs> jokes to continue about that. No, honestly, that's a great point. And, and yes, one of a, one of the common themes I guess in the French in general just on like a philosophical explain the dynamic of the opening is it, it, kind of like that though. Like you said, you're trying to just keep the king side as close as possible, sort of survive the checkmate attack because there is the potential that when bishop d7, queen a5, or in even like a different kind of French, like a winnower, white almost always loses the queen side battle, right? So so black is kind of yeah. playing the long game to make sure that the, as long as the counterplay on the king side, you know, is under control, eventually black gets his due on the, on the queen side. And now with queen a8, the only move I see for white is b3, but then white can continue with bishop, black can continue with bishop to d7. Or h6 first to chase away the knight makes perfect sense. And next move, bishop d7. I think black is doing more than okay here. Okay. Well, uh, Greg Shahadi pointed out in the chat that he he remembers a game where maybe Fabiano beat Georg Meyer in a position similar to this, but I don't have that game up. So we'll see. Anna Anna likes black. I'm, I'm biased toward white's position and Fabiano, I guess. But we'll see what happens here. I do agree that this is actually starting to look a little bit more awkward for white by the second because... Oh, wow. I was going to say, because if Ooh. you have to retreat that knight, and he says, I'm not retreating the knight. I'm going to leave it on G5. And if you take it, uh, you're a wizard, Harry, on the H file. Wow, that's a fancy move. King to B1, not minding that his knight on G5 is hanging. And you know what? I think Nizhnik will not take the knight on G5 just now, but he will play bishop to D7 to attack the other knight. And he can capture on g5 in the right moment. So for now, I agree that h takes g5 could be really dangerous in terms of it opens up the h file. And after h takes g5, h takes g5, queen h2, next move. Um, that's quite a lot of attack on the king side. So why not bishop d7 and a5, a4? Oh, he, oh, does he doesn't he takes care. It. He takes it. He takes it. He wants the piece. He's calling Fabiano's bluff. I love this. This would be a huge comeback victory for Nizhnik. Obviously, losing with the white pieces last game against uh, Wesley So, but you, you just got to win your next game with Black in the French against Fabiano Caruana, right? That's how you do it. And he, he just takes that piece. Um, wow. wow. He doesn't care. And it's true that after placing the knight on G6, if queen H2, the only thing that White is threatening is one check yep. on H7. Once the king is on F7, no more checks, and rook H8 is coming to trap the queen. Sometimes one check is all you need, Anna, okay? I mean... <laughs> Don't judge it too hard. No, I'm kidding. It doesn't look good for Fabiano. Honestly, I'm like, what is going on with this attacking idea? <laughs> because this doesn't look good. Um, and uh, Ilya is, he's focused. He's uh, hes playing uh, playing aggressive chess. KPOKO in the chess TV chat says Missouri, the show me state. Is Missouri the show me state? Can we get a fact check on that? I show wish me I state? knew more about U.S. states. Yeah, you don't know about the U.S. states, as you shouldn't. I would I would know as little as possible about the United States of America if I was you. Um, <laughs> but uh, but today I have learned a lot. Now I know what T-shirt guns are. Yeah, now, are. I mean, America is good for one thing. That's T-shirt guns. Don't underestimate that. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a brick wall behind him, Cheesy Chess Mouse, because as Eric Rosen confirmed, everybody there is being held against their will. We're working on an escape plan right now called Samuel Jackson, <laughs> and uh, we're negotiating a hostage exchange. Um, all right, we're going to go check on a different game because there's been a lot of exchanges. 
Queens are off the board. The D6 pawn is weak, and I actually really like Ray Robson's position here. If he continues to roll, he's doing his job as board one for the windmills. This actually just looks yes, like you did very well. this looks like a horrible King's Indian gun wrong. Usually you have this structure, Anna, in the kind of King's Indian where black has like an outposted knight on d4 or at least like knights on c5 and e5 and a dark square bishop going crazy. This is the kind of position where black gets compensation on all these dark squares for the weak positional d6 pawn, but there is no compensation, and white's plan is just so simple here, and you're just going to be positionally much better. I expect him to play king f2, just avoid tactics with f5, and then look for Ray Robson to put the other rook on the d file and just be much better in this endgame. I agree with you. I really like this position for white. The marks is set up without the light squared bishop being trapped inside the pawn chain. So it's all the positive features of the Maruti setup without anything yeah. negative. And you pointed out very well that Black doesn't have the usual counter attack or dynamics on the dark squares. Neither good outpost. There's no knight on e5. There's no bishop that could control. Like It could be on c5, b4, e5. That would be good for Black, but no, it's not the case. Yeah. No, it's uh, like you said, it's a Maroxy bind where White has a lot of the good things and, and not a lot of the bad things. And uh, we just saw a comment from Ray Robson there who said that he acknowledges that the Archbishops are their biggest rival and they have Wesley. And as he said, he thinks Wesley um, enjoys seeing Webster lose. And I'm just going to leave that one out there and let it linger for those who know the... Uh, those who know the uh, the chess world and exactly why that that's probably really true. I'll let you figure out why Wesley so... Uh, is happy when Webster loses, so we'll move on. <laughs> but I, I love it when these players say say what they're really thinking. So we we love controversy. Um, let's go back to Fabiano's game because that's the most controversial position we have yet. Um, he sacked is a piece it? and Ooh. Queen H three still aiming for this H file attack, but Ilya Nizhnik is calling the bluff of the world number two, giving up a piece on G five. He's saying, "No, I'm not getting mated. Prove yourself." Wow. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see the attack being so great here for, for Fabiano. I guess from a practical point of view it's you're just kinda keeping the pressure and, and, and see if you can swindle your way to making this checkmate attack work, but if you were black in an over the board game with plenty of time on the clock, what would be the plan here? Do you do you want to ball in voluntarily get the king out. The problem, I guess, here for black everybody is if you voluntarily play king f7, now we can take f5 because the rook no longer protects um, mm -hmm. protects the pawn. Oh, did he do that? Oh, he did just play king f7. He has just played king to f7, yeah, offering the f5 pawn. So g takes f5, e takes f5, bishop takes f5 is what I'm expecting. He's going to take and twice and play king e7, play? which I guess makes sense because the queen guards the knight. The rook gains a tempo on the queen, preventing something like rook h7 from being possible. So maybe this is actually a, a very straightforward way. And, and yeah, he's going for that exact line right now. Yes, up to king e7, the queen is hanging and then the f4 pawn. So even though the black king is quite vulnerable on e7, white's pieces cannot get to it. It's only the queen that is trying to attack. The a4 knight is not joining the attack and the rooks are not ideally placed for white. So I think Iznik is doing very well to produce an upset. And I think we're going to continue to analyze this game here. But uh, before we dive totally down... Uh down the, the deep, into the deep end of this game. Let me just quickly show everybody Wesley So right now with the white pieces against Grabis Grabinski. Um, the board four for the windmills having just played the move C5, which actually kind of interesting, sacrificing the C pawn for the A5 pawn. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I wonder if it, if it would work. He takes C5, and if queen takes A5, I think he'll retreat the knight to D3 and try to get B4 if you're Wesley. No. No, e on delay. Wow. We've got, and Joshua uh, Grabinski has uh, <laughs> has some cheerleaders with him, as jo far as I can see. Joshua Grabinski joining us live from the living room of Stranger Things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was going to say something else about the observers, the observers of the room, but I won't. <laughs> Uh, what matters is uh, we've got we've got wallpaper I haven't seen since uh, 
Like I said, since Winona Ryder was looking for her kid on the other side of it. <laughs> now he's in the upside down. <laughs> oh, for those of you who don't watch Stranger <laughs> Things, shame on you. Anna, you watch Stranger Things? Yeah, that's producer, Aaron. Let's kiss, give him some love. I'm going to use the Aaron emote in the chat if I find it with my other computer quickly. Shout out to Aaron I love for this it. amazing production that he's bringing on every single week. Wesley So is uh, blowing this one open here. Takes F5 now and looks like he's going to play B4 next and then take on E6. Um, or take on E6 first, actually. He figured out a way to make the tactics work for him with this move E4. I was anticipating you might take a slower approach, like I said, to hold on to the pawn. But no, just no reason not to go full steam ahead. Aggressively opening up the position. Now the move rookie one means that taking F5... Probably meant by queen rook takes e8 and then queen to f7. So, um, okay. And uh, just to quickly say that the, the Ray Robson game still won where white's a little bit better, but shout out to uh, Theodoro who did finally get some counterplay to help justify the weak pawn on d6 by poking at the b3 pawn. He stops white from doubling rooks, at least at this moment. And, and we are being told that Fabi keeps sacrificing, even though it's only a pawn this time, but he's giving up his E pawn yep. to open up the E file. And that's really instructive because the king on E7 is hiding behind his E5 pawn. So he says, E6, take it. I'm trying to figure out. We've got the position of Danny where he, when he played E6. In the in the Fabiano game, yeah, on move twenty eight. Yeah, opening up new lines, right? That's kind of the key there, I guess, because he's already all in on this sacrifice, right? You got to justify some yeah. serious account account a counterplay, which is attacking counter. and a and counterplay together. A counterplay. A counterplay. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, you have to, and that's a good practical lesson, even if it doesn't work out. Uh, sometimes I think players fail in an attack and start thinking, ah, oh, I just got to hold on to all my material at this point. But if you're already down a significant amount, all that's really going to matter is your ability to create threats and, and keeping the initiative. And so um, this move E6, even if it doesn't ultimately work out, I think is the right one for Fabiano to try to keep as many lines open as possible. You guys are hilarious in the chat. I just want to give a shout out to all 1,581 of you. I am reading the chat, so if I'm if I'm laughing just by myself, it's because I'm reading the comments. Um, I, <laughs> almost, almost, Mary Grumpy, almost, Mary Grumpy. Shout out to Steffi94. I agree. Nizhnik playing very well today. It had a great position against Wesley, but ultimately, ultimately kind of just failed because of time pressure, right? I mean, full credit and kudos for those of you who maybe just got here. You missed a brilliant game by Wesley So in game one where he won with the black pieces over Nizhnik with a rook sacrifice right at the end. So I think Wesley gets credit, but overall Nizhnik kind of beat himself after outplaying Wesley. He had a very healthy A pawn. I don't think you and I were crazy, Anna, to thinking that, that Nizhnik was much better. Mm -hmm. um, I think so, too. He had a pawn up, and yeah. then this uh, suddenly there was attack with this, this amazing rook sacrifice that Wesley has found. So he definitely yep. he definitely made it possible for for Nizhnik to make uh, mistakes. He was he was getting him into a difficult position and with not much time on the clock, that's where mistakes happen. Yeah, and so after that, if uh, if he's forgotten about it, which looks like he has and can convert this one against Fabiano, he'll He'll still be very happy to have split against the two-headed monster of So and Carwana. Speaking of which, what would they look like as a two-headed monster? Like, if So and Carwana... <laughs> Are you requesting new Photoshop? Right. I mean, maybe not a monster, maybe Siamese twins. Photoshop contest. One-year diamond membership. Impromptu Photoshop contest. Anna, Anna Rudolph inspires the Photoshop... Photoshop and me, which you don't do Photoshops anymore before we have commentary. I don't know what I what I did to upset you. I, but... will, I, I have already something planned. Okay. I will have a special Photoshop for the finals. It, I, I was you, just teasing. Robert, but Alex and me. I already have it in my head. Let's I do just it. Need to make it. Let's do a one-year diamond membership. One-year diamond membership, and I'll gift a sub on the chess channel if you're not a sub there. Full bore if you can make us 
either Siamese twins or what's that like Greek monster? The Hydra. Hydra with the dual mm. snake heads. So and Carwana. <laughs> I'm thinking best Photoshop there. Maybe we'll show your tweet on the show today if you turn it around quickly. Um, and uh, Soruana, <laughs> according to we Kokorev. I like it. Um, so can it be also a Hydra twins? Anything that combines the two players into yeah. one? Anything that combines them into a into a single unit. Uh, keep it PG. Um, all right, G six is played here. Uh, the D five pawn still poisoned, right? You can't take it as long as the rooks come into D eight and it's a skewer. This is one of those moments where you just hate knights if you're Fabiano Caruana, Anna, because that knight on e6 just defends everything right now, right? It defends yeah. g7, defends the dark squares from there being checks, um, which is what prevents a move like queen takes d5 because the knight is just stopping all checks. So, um, And now, now Nizhnik is going to try to get the queens off the board. Always a smart thing to do when you're up a piece. Okay. That knight on e6, as you mentioned, is doing a great job defending. And the knight on a4, even though it is blocking the a5, so black cannot attack there, but it's not doing anything else. It's not an attacking piece. And white is really lacking pieces in this attack, where I think his position is just lost by this stage. It's a piece down. He doesn't even have any checks. Yeah, and I agree. And and it also seems like Nizhnik is just a few moves away from sol consolidating everything. Um here you could put a rook on c8, not the f rook though, because f2 falls. Okay, so he's going to try to fix that with the bishop coming to e3, maybe even to h6 actually, where it guards g7 and traps this rook on h7. Um, but if you give black a few moves, right, you go, you overprotect g7, you put your rook on the c file, and now it's debatable who's on the attack, right? It's definitely something that is looking tougher and tougher for Fabiano, and just huge shout out for. Um, for Ilya Nizhnik, who's just played very this well today. This is incredible because it's not just that he's facing the world number two with the black pieces and he played the French defense, shout out to Ilya Nizhnik, but he also had to overcome a painful defeat in just the previous yep. round. He had a better position yep. and he lost it. Yep. Agreed totally. And let's go look at this game with So, who um, hasn't put Grabinski away yet. The C pawn looking strong, but also looking. Uh, Looking alone there, it's it's all the way advanced, but I, I don't see how you stop it from falling. Even queen b8 check is met by knight g8, and I don't see mm -hmm. a follow-up. So if you're Wesley So, you're trying to come up with some way to make back rank threats before the c-pawn just falls. Because honestly, if, if you take the c-pawn off the board and black doesn't have back rank issues here, who's better? Yeah, that's a good question with the doubled F pawns of yeah, white these... and this G2 bishop being uh, just basically a gigantic pawn on yeah. G2 at this stage. Oof. No, this is not a not a great position for Wesley if he doesn't find something tactically uh, right now. Now, he's also up six minutes on the clock, I just observed, and that's probably going to pay, pay off. Bishop H3, I guess, threatens bishop takes F5 if rook takes C7. Yes, and so we have this position on the board that you mentioned. White is still a pawn up. But I don't think it's that bad because of uh, simply black having the active pieces, yep. the queen on c3 and, and right up place, and if he could bring the rook as well and not get mated on the back rank. But the knight on f6, we can always jump back to g8. So I think if it wasn't for the fact that he's got 18 seconds oh, yeah. left. <laughs> no, I agree 15. totally. If you remove the clock here, Grabinski's position is is not bad at all. Um, and by the way, to point out why bishop takes f5 didn't work is because Grabinski would have taken h2 with check and then taken b7, so I was wrong about that, everybody. Sorry about that. But he does eventually get the queens off the board. He needs he needs a couple moves. He needs to be able to play g6 and defend the f-pawn and get his rook, get some sort of blockade on the b-pawn. Um, he plays rook c6, so that means he's going to lose f5, but... Is it even... But it's two pawns already. I don't think that the last few moves of black were yeah. the best. He's got six seconds left, and now he's two pawns down in an endgame where the bishop is out too, so everything has changed in favor of Wesley. Well, I think Rubinsky's going to struggle to hold this mainly because of time, but oh, look, at we got to go back to the Caruana game. This is just crazy. Crazy as in 
Nizhnik has Whoa. done exactly what he's supposed to do. Played pretty much perfect chess since we left it. He actually did go for the idea we highlighted. He brought the bishop back to h6 to keep the rook out of the game. And then used the c-file to bring bring it home on c2. I think Carwana might be moments away from just resigning here. This is... There's, there's, there's checkmate threats, by the way, everybody. The bishop guards c1. So if you give black a check, it's rook b2, rook takes a2, and then the other rook delivers checkmate on b2. So yep. So something like knight takes d5, Anna, is it just met by queen takes d5? Ooh, quite possibly, because then with this queen sacrifice, it's the rookmate that you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Carwana didn't see that or if he's about to walk into it, but I think he's moments away from resigning because I don't see how you stop that plan. Can we see his camera? Is it possible? Yeah, we'll, to we'll bring up to Fabiano him? maybe okay. to see him, or uh, or Mr. Nizhnik, one or the other. But this is a huge moment, and it definitely would be a huge, huge uh, blow for for St. Louis if Caruana loses uh, this early on. Um, they're up three one, and again, they do have draw odds if you're just joining us. But but y you know, you also rely on on your strongest players getting it done, and I and I think Fabiano's going down here. Um, yeah, he's also going down on the webcam. He doesn't yeah, really want to be on screen down at the, on the moment. Webcam. Yeah, it's uh, he's uh, he's acting it out. He's acting out his feelings right now by sinking down. Yeah. Um, this is a difficult moment for the world number two. I don't see a way for him to save it. I just don't yeah, see no, a move. No, it's over. Not In fact, even queen takes c2, sacrificing the queen for two rooks, just delays the inevitable because. Black still just brings the queen to e2 check, and again, this bishop here is that thorn in your shoe that is irritating enough for you to stop, take your shoe off, take your sock out, look in your sock, what is poking me, and then you see it's a bishop <laughs> on h6. Okay, so in fact, he's going to get rid of it with rook takes, but now we have a lot of ways to win. The queen can come to f4 with check. This is just over. Rook b2 check, rook mm -hmm. takes a2. And when the king comes back to b1, the final blow is queen to f4. And uh, I think that that'll be how we see it. That's the line I'm seeing. Yep, Nizhnik finds it, and it's over. Game over, and what a game by Ilya Nizhnik. Absolutely. After having to forget that he had a better position against Wesley so that he eventually lost, and then he had to face the second best player in the entire world, Fabiano Garona, with the black pieces. Yep. There's actually several interesting moves here that because of this last knight takes d5 trick. If Nizhnik wants, he can play queen to c7 check for kicks and giggles just to make sure he takes the queen with check on d2. Um, he's winning no matter what line he goes for, but okay, he actually finds that. I, I It's funny, I spotted that move and I was wondering if he would go for it because that forces the king to d1 and then you would actually get rid of the queen with check, avoiding the fork. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Nice. So he sees it, and it should be good enough for... I keep saying Carwana's going to resign, and not happening, but... Um, yeah, these guys never give up. He still tries to find some kind of a lost miracle resource. But it's a now, rook now, down. Now he does, point. indeed. And so Fabiano falls, but so is victorious against Grabisky. So, so that helps the bishops. But then you have Shimonov getting a win against Josh Bloomer right as we speak in the books. Um, and Ray Robson still fighting against Nicolas Theodoro. That's the last game yeah, of this our, round. Our last game in this round. And, game. and who's better? Ray Robson with a pawn up, but Black is pretty active. His king and the bishop, which is better when there are pawns on both flanks, better than the knight. Super intense. We're almost <laughs> at half time. <laughs> We're almost halfway through this match, everybody, and it there seems to be a pretty decent chance it's going to be a, a, a tied match. Robson is up a pawn, despite Black's extra king. If he does what he's supposed to do here, then the windmills just just uh, turned around that 3-1 result with a 3-1 result of their own. Now he can play for g5 yeah. and h5. Yeah, he goes for it. Indeed, creating a pass on the king side will do the job, but both players are down to seconds. The king is chased out. Oh, knight g3. That's the final blow. That's going to force the, the king and pawn ending. King and, and pawn ending, which is a winning for white. Yeah, even even h5 down. might have been winning, but no reason to try to calculate your way to a win when you're just up a healthy Peshka. Uh, it is. It is a very healthy Peshka. H5, this g6. 
Theo Joro. Wow, what a comeback by the windmills yep. scoring as many as three points in this last round. Wait a second. Huh? Yeah, they no, have won. Uh, they, 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 won. they went Shimano three and won. one. won. And they only lost on their last board, right? We're tied 4-4. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for getting here, Diamond member Wing Wing Chess Edward, because guess what? You got here just in time. The match is tied 4-4. We are heading into the the uh, the halfway point of this matchup between these two heavyweights from St. Louis. So don't go anywhere. We are going to be right back with all the action in round three's set of games. And we are back, joined by a surprise special guest. Danya, how did you get here? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I just um, I just woke up from a from a trance, and all of a sudden, just, I was I was on the pro league show. There you are. All of a sudden, you're on the <laughs> pro chess it. league show, and and who knew it? Well, uh, great timing by you because we are in the middle of a of an epic match here with a four four tie. St. Louis jumped out to a three one lead. Webster comes right back. It seems like there's a lot on the line here. A lot of nerves for both teams. Danya, what's your what's your thought on? on playing in this sort of pressure pack situation and uh, the advice or sharing your own experiences from being in big moments like that. And what would be the advice you would have for players on either team? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, obviously my team, the SF mechanics didn't make the playoffs with that said though, you know, even, even during the regular season, um, there were plenty of high pressure moments during battle Royale during battle royales and um of course in my chess career i've i've been in plenty of um just nail biting situations that just drive everyone crazy spectators and players included i think that you know there's there's a couple of cliches which which of course ring true in these situations in the first place um you know i i found in my own pro league experience this season that my success rate was inversely proportional to the amount of times that i clicked on other games while i was playing so the more I would observe, you know, you know, how, how is Steven doing? How is, how is, you know, how's Andrew doing? Andrew Hong, our, our board four, right. um, you know, that would sow the seeds of anxiety when I thought that they were winning and that meant I needed a draw, only a draw. And often that's very counterproductive. So I think the main thing is of course, to play, not to over overdo the, you know, different openings just because for example, you need a draw. Um, the best way I think to get a draw, for example, is is to obviously to play for a win and to play normally. Um, so it's always fun to watch these situations and and to see how various players react. But you know the key thing is to to stay hydrated and stay calm. And um, I mean to to click on other games um, as as little as possible. I think. It's Great advice, actually, and unique, unique, I think, to the Pro Chess League format, right, Anna? I mean, this is, we talk about the team game and the fact that there is so much that goes into your results here because now you're, you know, you're accountable to your teammates. But I think that makes a lot of sense, right? It's like the old cliche, you got to focus on what you can control, right? Focus on your game, exactly. focus on what's in front of you, right? Precisely. I mean, and, and the same thing applies. I played in, like, the World Team Championship, um, and we had some very high-pressure situations. And, um, yeah, you just... At the end of the day, you know, you, you play your own game. Um, you play for yourself, and and the best way to be, you know, I think the best way to play for the team is perhaps paradoxically to to put yourself first and and to to do what you can. And however the cards may fall, you know, that's how they fall. And that's a great advice to uh, because overall it's an individual game. We only have our boards, but you cannot make moves or give suggestions on the rest of the boards and it may put extra pressure on you if you know that oh i only need a draw or i have to win well, this game no matter what but on that note you mentioned it it's it's about only needing a draw right one of the unique things about the playoffs is that if st louis ends this match at an 8-8 tie right which i guess mathematically we're sort of on pace for right now it's a 4-4 uh, uh deadlock as we head into round three do you think that changes anything about their mindset or approach? We know that there is, of course, the, the the potential pitfalls of playing for a draw. Right now, you maybe make bad choices. You know, we've talked about the psychology of not doing what you objectively think is right on the chessboard. But but does that change anything in your approach? Does it change the openings you prepare? Does it change something about how you consider a matchup if you're considering that maybe there is a little bit of an advantage of not taking too many risks if you're St. Louis in some of the some of the closer maybe uh, matchups in terms of rating. Yeah. Um, so, so you said St. Louis, St. Louis advances with a draw. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So, I mean, 
from a very concrete standpoint, this is a piece of advice that was shared to me. I, um, when I was playing millionaire chess in 2014, um, I needed a draw to like uh, advance either to the final four or it turned out that I advanced to the rapid playoffs, uh, the tiebreakers, which I, which I ended up losing, but that doesn't matter. I needed a draw against Yu Yang Yi. And my coach at that point, Lef Sahis, uh, grandmaster currently living in Israel, actually told me that when you're playing white, uh, provided that you that you play both e4 and d4, um, like that you're not sort of, you don't only play one of these moves. Um, one e4 is generally, and perhaps not, not something that is intuitively obvious, but is a better way to take less risks and to kind of quote unquote play for a draw. Uh, because of the amount these days of forced lines, it's very, very hard for black against e4, even in like an open Sicilian, to avoid, you know, um, simplifying lines. Of course, the Berlin is a forced draw, which I so shamelessly displayed in the final round of the US Championship against Wesley. Um, <laughs> and and so, but but overall, of course, like you can't, like you cannot keep telling yourself, oh, I need a draw, I need a draw. The only time that you really tell yourself that is if you have, say, a perpetual, and like then it's a no-brainer. But it's very risky to go into an equal end game, for example, because then, you know, you get that voice in your head that's like, oh, I'm so close to drawing, I'm so close, so close to drawing, I can't make a mistake. So I found that playing sharp positions can actually help because then, you know, you do away with the whole like, oh, I need to like play a certain way. You become a little bit freer and then, you know, calculation is calculation. Right. So, Yeah. I'm um, talking about the, these players, and I'm also curious about the, your per personal experience. When you see uh, Fabian or Caruana, obviously, so and you know that you need to play against these guys. How do you approach these games where you know that where you are facing some of the world's best players? What's the mentality that the players should have? Um, I think, again, I'm, it's hard for me not to speak in, in platitudes here, but uh, personally, you know, when I played, I played a bunch of these guys in battle royale. Like um, I played a bunch, you know, a bunch of clowns like Fabi and Nakamura. It was a bad piece of cake. I was, um, yeah, I had a very, very easy day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you, I, I think I did too. I mean, first of all, of course, like you, you play the board, and you know, you recognize that these, like, when you're the underdog, I mean, it's, it's the one advantage that I, that I have is even with the white pieces. I mean, they're going to play for a win, so you, you know, you don't need to create anything they will create the trouble right. um and then it's my task to to calculate as well as i can and to you know to call them on their bluffs and and of course like the second thing is that you get into a lot of bad positions against these people and I, with fabio is completely lost but you know he gets nervous just like the you know just like the rest of humanity um when when you have a winning position it's it's natural to to get anxious and so mm -hmm creating tricks and creating trouble and because I'm lost most of the time. Um, it's something that I, you know, that I am, am, am intimately acquainted with and it, it works even against people like Fabi and Wesley. They, nobody likes good resistance. So you can't just fold over and die, you know, when, when they've out prepare you or, or when you have a bad position, you're lower on time. Um, you have to fight tooth and nail. It's the only way. I like that you can't just fold over and die. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember that <laughs> piece of advice for myself too. <laughs> I think it's uh, uh, excellent advice and an entire interview that I think could be used as a motivational speech at coaching for a lot of these teams. So thank you, Danya, for being so uh, well spoken in, in your in your thoughts uh -huh. and answers to all of our questions. I really appreciate your time here. We're we're gonna jump back into round three, which is now officially underway. We've got Wesley So and Ray Robson. Um, Speaking of a Berlin, but playing the four D three variation of the Berlin, so not the four, yeah, not the forced draw that we what we sometimes see. Um, but uh, anyway, Danya, uh, shout out to everybody in Twitch chat. If you didn't know, uh, Daniel Nerdisky, a regular streamer, you can go to twitch.tv slash Doctor Dragonitsky. Right? Is that the? That's correct. Uh, yeah. You got to stop can changing have a link your Twitch in the chat channel. to Danya's the channel that will be great. Can you guys please link sure. it? I see now Benjamin yeah. and Mubot is suggesting. There you go. Click, you can on, that click on that link. Danya. Uh, Danya, of course, uh, very humble in, in discussing his results against some of these top players, but actually one of the strongest human beings on the planet himself, one of the strongest bullet players especially. We expect you to be trying to qualify for the Bullet Chess Championship in a couple of oh, weeks. Yes. And uh, um, Anyway, good luck to you and everything you're doing. Good luck to the Twitch channel, and maybe we'll catch Thank up you. with you later in the playoffs. Thank you, Danny. Thank and, you for uh, joining us, pleasure, Danny. A pleasure, a pleasure to be here. And uh, you guys do fantastic commentary. So um, I'm looking forward to watching and, and enjoying. Thanks, man. Thanks.
Thank All you right. so much. Bye. Bye. Danny, we've got our first and maybe last compliment of the day. For, from Danya? Yes. He's the best. He's so nice. Danya's the best. I know he didn't mean it. He just wants to be nice, but it feels good. <laughs> uh, no, he really he really is. He's awesome and uh, and, and legit, just an absolute monster, in, especially in Blitz and Bullet. Um, you know, not many people can, can on occasion, uh, you know, hang with guys like Hikaru and guys, uh, uh, some of the world's elite, but, but he manages to, and... Um, so if you're not following his Twitch channel, you sh you're definitely missing out on some of those epic battles. So you should do it. Uh, there you go. We definitely. have the um, we have the results as we head into round three on the screen, and uh, it's going to be a nail biter, Anna. We've already got Wesley So and Ray yeah. Robson up here for everybody. Um, the game between uh, Theoduro and Grabinski also underway, as well as the game between Nizhnik and Bloomer. Uh, you tell me. You choose. You choose our adventure. This time, where do you want to take this this part of the show? Um, good question. I was looking at this queen on h5 by Wesley So. Of course, it's still the opening and uh, nothing is happening on f7. But one mistake I could point out is castle kingside, the usual development, placing your king in a safe square. No, don't do that. Don't. You're saying that castles is a bad idea here? Just a little bit, maybe. A... Maybe castle queen side, but that gives up the f7 yeah. pawn. So don't castle at all. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that was a that was a good question for the chat to see if they were paying attention about why they why they couldn't castle, but we gave them the answer. So let's give them another question, shall we? Instead of that one about yeah. why you don't want to castle and get checkmated, let's give you the daily question and ask who was the best 2019 pro chess streamer. We just talked about Doctor Dragonitsky. That's Danya Naroditsky, but. If you didn't know, so many of the players streamed their own perspectives. Who were they? Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura? Something tells me he'll mm -hmm. be amongst the top vote-getters. Uh, Maxime bache Legrave streamed while playing. Um, you had... Jan Ludwig Hammer, the captain of the Novi Gnomes. He has been streaming too regularly. Jan Ludwig Hammer. Daniel Arnitz has been mentioned already. Yep. <laughs> uh, the chess bras, of course. I just read that if we count as well. No, commentators don't count. Don't, Com don't no, even. No, not us. Not, don't, not, don't waste your votes. Not us. But but I think the chess bra channel counts. Um, they have commentary the for their, bras, yeah. their team. Yes. I think. Um, and uh, Eric Rosen did commentary for many of the Webster Windmill matches. So lots of choices. Um, if you uh, if you didn't know, there was so much coverage and so many people streaming their own perspective. And make sure you give us a follow before you go anywhere else and watch the Pro Chess League all year. Because um, we do have more. Do they need to be the players though? Because I'm thinking that, for instance, Levy got some chess covering the New York Marshals, but he wasn't playing. So right. I think he also counts as a pro chess streamer. Yeah, I guess so it should just be just for players. Yeah, let us know who your favorite streamer was, just amongst those who who streamed their own perspective. Um, hmm. good, okay, great, so now you're looking question. for the player. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. Um... Yeah, Steffi94 says, Hammer's always fun. He gets to get so emotional. That is one of the best parts of Hammer's streams, that he really can kind of lose himself sometimes. And, 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 uh, and yeah. Um, all right, where'd it go? So many interesting games in this one. We've been looking at this one with So and, and Ray Robson, which may end up being really exciting. Started out, I wasn't sure what this Berlin was going to give us, but now we have kings on opposite sides of the board, Anna. I expect yeah, to finally free. some action. I love it. With the knight jumping to c4 to attack the bishop, the queen on h5 is still doing a good job at least stopping the the kingside pawns yep. of black and just making sure that it's not so easy for black to activate his own pieces. There's no black queen coming to h4. But what's next? How to crack the queen side? Bishop e3 is logical to develop and if bishop takes e3, he can take back both with the knight or with the pawn to open the f file. Yeah, I like I like this move, Bishop E three, and I expected him to take with the pawn. Although, yeah, you made me realize maybe maybe the knight is good if it keeps the F five square open. But I think something tells me opening the F file kind of strengthening your control of the center here. And again, everybody, these double pawns are really not your typical weak double pawns. In fact, often very very useful here because they're not on an open file, so they're not really easy to attack, and they're very useful in guarding key squares. So. Um, I ex yeah, okay, he does. He does indeed take with the pawn, and, and I think white's a little better. I'm not sure that white's a little better in the Karwana game, though. Sh hmm. Shamanov, uh, playing pretty quickly in this Karakhan defense, has already locked up the king side with the h5 uh, advance. Um, 
Yes, which is usually good when black manages to get this hold on the king side yeah. so that when the knight is on f5, it can't be chased away with g4. A4, yeah, so it's going to be a full board approach here from Caruana to keep keep flexible options open, ways to advance. I think that uh, Shimanov has done a good job. He, he must be well prepared, even though he has played slower than Fabiano. Interesting that Fabi is really <laughs> in bullet mode or at least blitz mode. I don't like his position that much, so I'm not convinced that this is a refutation of the Karakan, but he is very quick, that's for sure. Well, people laughing at his 4f4 um, rather than the most common main lines against this variation with Vishva 5, just knight f3 is a move, mm. knight d2 is a move, h4 is a move, g4 is even a move, f4 is, is I think, less common than all of those moves, and uh, Shimanov ultimately has closed up the position and I think probably doing just fine here with black, but we'll, we'll see a lot, a lot of life left in this one. Um, let's go to the game between Grabinski and Theodoro. Cause that's moving along faster than the others. And at this point Ooh. in a tied match, just cause they don't have names like Wesley. So Carwana Ray Robson doesn't mean their game isn't just as critical for their team. That's, that's the beauty of the pro chess league. So um, this looks a little bit overly aggressive for Grabinski. I think Theodoro's position is potentially going to be very good here against this wide open king on G2. And uh, I'm not, if we back up, I want to see what happened here. Because this is typical on move 8, Anna. Even with the move G4, like this is kind of a typical structure. Takes C6, bishop E3, E6. Uh, and now he, he castles and allows B4. Um, which gives up the e4 pawn. I was wondering where has that pawn gone. He either forgot about b4 or wanted to sacrifice that pawn, saying that he's got the initiative. I'm not sure why it has that he, much. I think he blundered it. I think in this move war with knight c6, you either have to kick the knight from f6 with g5 or even play queen d3, which is something that, while normally you might be a little nervous about putting your queen on a square like that. By the way, shout out to all those gifted subs. Thank you so much. From, uh, Thank you, Abram42, wow. for the multiple gift subs. Yeah. That That's amazing. Thanks a lot. And the reason I say queen d3 is normally awkward is because in a lot of these Sicilians, what ha what you have here is a knight on b8 coming to d7, which of course comes to e5 and c5 and hits the queen. Uh, or even a knight on c6 can hit the queen via b4 and e5. So typically, uh, you don't see the queen safe on a square like d3. But here, it would have been safe on d3. So again, I would have suggested g5 or queen d3, but... I, I think he just blundered this pawn, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, mm. the fact that his king is open, he's down a pawn, and I feel black has the compensation here. This this does not look good for Grabinski at all. I agree with you fully. All that black needs to do is to finish development, but he is two moves away from playing bishop e7 and castle kingside. I don't think that... Wow! That, oh my, that oh my, might, I that might already be on pace to win there. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because it looks like they're smiling with however they did that. Great From job. <laughs> it looks like Eric. they're looking at each other like, hey, man, you ready to eat these kids? Oh, yeah, bro. I am so ready to eat these kids. Wesley So and Fabiano <laughs> looking at each other. Um, wow. And, and that's just to remind everyone of our Photoshop contest yep. because Danny loves to come up with these impromptu contests. You can win a one one. Year is that one year diamond membership? Yeah. I believe that you can Danny also has win a uh, Wahoo, whatever you said, or is that a Yoohoo, a chocolate drink? You can win a yeah, sure. Yeah. We offer that too, and a subscription to chess.com's Twitch yep. channel. Anything you want That's for right. one great photo of the Wesley, So, Fabiano, Karana combination. How would they look like as a one human creature or some kind of a mythological creature? Anything that you can come up with. So, all right, so G5 played. Um, this game over here with Caruana and Shimanov is moving along. Still a very close position, but I kind of like Fabiano's position a little better now than I did before. Um, we'll see if he can organize anything with H3 and G4, maybe F5. And even though this seems really risky at first to open up your own king, such a close center sometimes call, uh, calls for desperate measures, closed measures here. You can get away with that mm -hmm. type of plan as long as the center remains closed. And I actually think that that's not a bad idea. You might even play g3 first to prevent h4 because one positional idea you got to be aware of is that um, 
if you ever play h3, black will probably play h4 and make that pawn backwards. So you play g3, which means that anytime black plays h4, you'll bypass it with g4. So, uh, But this is a creative idea. He wants to go get rid of this dark square bishop. This is a very French idea, if I might say so. It is. It is the knight maneuver. Yeah. Still, I don't like Black's position. It's less space, and his king is still stuck in the middle of the board. So I think Fabiano is on his way of getting this position right. into a bigger and bigger ad advantage. Yeah, now he's bringing his rook on the third rank, so he made double rooks on the F file. And also this rook may end up on G3, H3, just activating it through the third rank. Maybe even on G6 someday, right? That rook's got big dreams. Ooh, that rook's got big dreams. Yeah, that's a, that's a sack. All right, well... Big dreams. Ilya Nizhnik's got him. Um, he uh, he already won a game against Fabio Caruana last round with the black pieces. If you're just joining us, you missed missed a great game. Nizhnik has kind of been the talk of the whole round. He was also winning in the first game versus Wesley So. Ultimately, Wesley defended brilliantly and then really, really found an amazing tactic. I would recommend you back that up, maybe find a clip of it. Uh, but then Nizhnik recovered, right? He, he beat Fabiano mm -hmm. Caruana, so... Um, and we talked about that heading in, as I said. I think if you look at the lineup there below us, everybody, you look at these matchups on paper, Nizhnik is one that really stands out, right? He's a guy that is strong enough to play board two and sometimes even board one for some teams in the league, but he's able to be to be a board three in, in a lot of Webster's lineups, and um, that makes him the heavy favorite for these last two games against Josh Bloomer and Theodoro. You know, mm -hmm. don't be surprised if Nizhnik ends up with three out of four on the day, so... Yeah, and it could have been a victory in the first round too against Wesley So. So he's yep. playing very well. Now this position against Josh Bloomer, I think Black is is he already in trouble because the e5 pawn is pinned and White is attacking that pawn already with three pieces plus the rook will come to e1. How do you even keep protecting that pawn? I, I, rook e1. Rook e I don't, Anna. I don't keep protecting it. I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're right. You're this lose is. It. This is why we like Nizhnik's position. And again, this is the first game he's had so far today where he was favored, right? So good for him. Way to go, that guy. He really tough. He really stuck it out. Um, yeah, wow. And after this, he has another opponent that's supposed to be weaker than him. So in terms of the rating points, because yep. anyone can have a great game, of course. But Nizhnik, yeah. Imagine if he had gone 4-0. Wow, right? That would have been... Uh, the Webster Windmills are in position to win this match anyway, but that would have been um, huge. And uh, the uh, probably the, the biggest game in this round, for those of you shouting in chat about why we haven't looked at it, well, that's partly because it hasn't been as exciting as some of the others. I know on paper, um, speaking of huge <laughs> games, it is, it, is, it is one of the biggest, So versus Robson, but kind of a tame position right now, Anna. Black is threatening the E4 pawn. I think White will play the Rook to E1. At some point, probably play c3 to defend the loose d4 pawn. But not not a ton going on here. Going to take somebody somebody slipping up to allow any any kind of real weakness to play for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this position, even though it's opposite side castling, it's not that typical aggressive attack that we would expect. It's more of a positional style. I could actually enter an endgame shortly if the queens are off of the board with queen e6, for instance. Yep. So this is quite a balanced position, I would say. Yeah. More balanced than Fabi's game. I love that rook on h3. So after rook f3, he has brought his rook now to h3. Black didn't castle, but he walked to the king side with king f8, king g7. He had to do something about that king, of course. But now with this pawn on h4, um, I think white is just doing very well. He's got more space in the center and also on the queen side. Plus, he puts pressure on on his opponent on the king side. Basically, he's everywhere. Yeah, he's everywhere. He, this guy can't be stopped. You can't you can't stop Fabi. You can only hope to contain him. Um, <laughs> and watch out for tactics with f5 coming at some point. And and whether whether Fabi ends up supporting it with a g pawn or not. Now that the king is fully committed here, and opening up this side of the board would be devastating. Just keep your eye on that. I don't expect Fabi to allow any sort of trade here. Maybe he'll put the bishop on c5, Anna, so that at the very least then if Shimonov tries to play Tickle and goes back to e7, now you could mm -hmm. ignore it because taking c5 would bring my knight to a very strong outpost square. So um, I expect g4, actually. g4 or g3 Ooh. met by en passant. Um, then you could take he a... He may j want to do that. Yes, after bishop f2, g4 is still an idea. 
I like it. Yeah, I, I, so not not G4 right away. Like we, oh, so he goes to F2, like you said. I was expecting C5, but at some point this move G4, huh? I don't know that I really like the bishop on F2. Oh, you know where he wants to put it? It's E1, I guess, where it defends both C3 and H4. That's an interesting square for the bishop, kind of a prophylactic mindset to guard guard things all over the board. Huh. Yeah, and Black's position, what's sad about Black's position is that he doesn't really have active counterplay. So he's just, he's keeping the position. It's not that easy to break Black's position, but he doesn't have any attack. Yeah. Um, I, I agree, although I, I still wish Fabi had already gotten G4, and if I was playing white, um, mm. we'll see how he, how he deals with this... Uh, this threat now after rook h5. I'm keeping an eye on the other games. The so Robson game continuing to sort of simplify its yeah, way out. Yeah, it's petering out. I think the Wesley so game. Yep. And I think that's just an equal end game. But on the other board, Joshua Grabinski versus Nicolas Theodoru. That is still a pawn up for Black. He hasn't managed to castle, uh -huh. but he's also attacking White's king. So it's funny that the Black king is on e8, but the h2 king is also vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, but again, it just feels like black is the one up upon, but also the one with better better chances. Although, yeah, I mean, if you give white a couple moves, if you give white something like g6, right, and you can undermine and, and blow open the position, or even f5, probably that's why Grabinski plays king g2, so he can try to move the f-pawn now that it's not pinned to the king. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I think I think Theodoro has not, has not made it totally easy on himself with his super aggressive play on the king side because I wonder if you could have argued that once he won this pawn back on move 17 Anna and we've got mm -hmm. the got the young man who's playing the black pieces here on camera I think you could argue that this whole idea of h5 might have been unnecessary right it it it's not to mm -hmm. say that um he's not getting an attack but you're up a clean pawn here uh as as black and you know if you can find a way to just get developed and get castled you're you're in a much safer scenario to just push the pawn, uh, push the game forward. And as is, he kind of goes all in with this king side approach. Which, okay, Black is still pushing, but now he's having to commit his own king to a square like d8 just to avoid tactics like f5 and discover check. So, so I don't know that Theodoro has has made his life that easy in this one. Yeah, so now he's trying to reposition his king by going king d8 with the idea possibly is that this king might end up on the queen side. But that's a bit of a long journey, king to c7, king b7, or king b8. And there will always be checks on a7 too, so he, he shouldn't really walk into that. Queen a7, if the king is on b8, that would be mate. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm looking at this one and, and not exactly sure, and... Neither is Theodoro. He's thinking about what to do here. Ooh, he finds rook c4. Wow. That's a strong move. I expect the queen to back up to d3. You could go all the way to d2. You could also go to a7 if you're really into that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. That could be wild. Um, yes, whose king is more vulnerable here? Queen to d3 he goes instead, not wanting to enter in that line with queen a7. Oh, this, this game can... I feel like it's three possible results, even though black is a pawn up. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. There's still any result possible. Likely, the only result in Nizhnik's game is still going to be a win for uh, <clears throat> what's been kind of the hero of the day so far for the windmills, mm -hmm. up a clear pawn in this one, um, and uh, just converting against Bloomer. So we'll keep our eye right here for a second. Grabinski and yeah, Theodoro. Yeah, so if Nizhnik wins, that will be a point for the windmills. Uh, but Wesley So and Ray Robson, that's likely to be a draw. And that means that either Fabiano or Nicolas Theodoro will have to score for the archbishops to make a comeback. So in case of a tie, it's the archbishops that move on. Mm -hmm. But eight and a half points, that is enough for the windmills to make it to the finals in San Francisco. He plays E5. And uh, he's just, he's not scared. Not scared, not scared at all. Here. His king is in the middle of the board and he goes for e5. Yeah. But he's got a big center and he, and he wants to use it. He's got e4 coming. He's got d4 coming. So, I mean, objectively, yes. 
I would be surprised if we turned on an engine here and it didn't just say that um, the black is still better. I mean, black is up a pawn, and white's king mm -hmm. is also still potentially very, very open. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very double-edged, and if the player's going to do time pressure, who knows what happens. KPO Co. in the Chess TV chat says, uh, says uh, this is a crucial, this is the crucial round. I agree. I think this is I think if, if either team gets an advantage in this round, they, they go on to win the match. I really think that. So, um, Quite possibly, yes. So this is only round three. There are four rounds in total, but I agree that this can be crucial. Yep. Also, it's very difficult to make a comeback when you are down on the scoreboard with only one round left. But hey, we have seen really huge comebacks, have, right? so anything can happen. No, but you're right. And part of the reason it's hard to see the comeback is that's when you get desperate. You make less accurate chess decisions. Chess is a very black and white objective game, right? And so you kind of have to make mm -hmm. good moves. Um, bluffs don't normally work. And so mm -hmm. the team that's winning heading into the last round wins wins most of the time, even even in close matches. Um, okay, interesting. The queens have come off the board, which I think actually really helps the Adoro. Now this big center is going to be a lot easier to hold on to. You're not as worried about the king safety here behind the pawns. Um, so despite the double pawns, they're also kind of really annoying because they hold back. Those two doubled pawns, as ugly ducklings as they might be, single-handedly hold back all of White's three pawns here. So um, I think Theod Theodoro is, is on pace here. The So Robson game, still on pace, I guess, for a draw because we just see a lot of equality and two very strong grandmasters. Um, yes, it's a symmetrical position, an end game where they have just five pawns versus five pawns, and I really don't see how this could go wrong. But Wesley, I'm sure he will try it, to put it, pressure on Ray. We also have our first lead in the match for the windmills with Nizhnik yeah. just taking that game home. The windmills have jumped out to a 5 4 lead. Again, not surprising. He was. This is his game to totally win. This is the board three versus board four matchup. You can look at who the players are right there in the pairings below us. So he's supposed to win here, but um, there you go. The windmills have, have jumped out, and that makes me wonder back in this game with Shimonov versus Karwana. This is the board two for the windmills versus board one mm -hmm. for the bishops. Every game now, I'm starting to... I'm getting nervous now, Anna. I need to like... Okay, this is it. We're getting... It's been a couple hours right now. We're building into it, but here we go. This is uh, this is where things are going to get wild. This is getting wild, and I'm wondering, is Fabiano still doing well here? I'm not sure about his queen on g4. It's almost trap. Yeah. And after rook g8, the threat is g takes f4, and the queen is really running out of space. Queen h3 would be the only square. This is not looking good for Fabi. I don't know what he has done before. Now, queen h5 allows g takes f4 with the tempo. Yeah. And he g4. Has a check -out. I'm queen actually... Uh, I was going to say, I kind of like g4, g4 better. It also... Because like, now you just yeah. move the king and the rook has to retreat. I I, I like that move. Um, and uh, the follow-up I'm looking for, in at some point is a well-timed knight move from the c-file so that this queen can enter on c3. Because one of the big reasons why I suggested g4 is if this rook leaves the third rank, now mm -hmm. the c3... Moves the in fact call me crazy but if if you go too far i mean there's even ideas like knight taking on b4 and the queen getting involved on the c file you have to be very very careful here with the b4 pawn also falling so probably unnecessary but and, and but but fabi keeps the rook on the third rank maybe to prevent tactics coming over the queen side yes and what's in fabi's favor is clearly the time situation he's got twice the time and in such a complex double edged position you definitely need to have some time for calculating yep shout out to grandmaster robert hess who is here with us in the chat he will be covering the next match between the minnesota blizzards and the shangdu pandas with the one and only danny ranch danny how comes that it's not robert doing a double shift but you I, you know what um i don't make my own schedule my wife and Aaron do my wife and Oren run my oh. life. Shout out to Oren. Let's throw Oren on camera here. Um, you heard me Studio arguing C. with Shauna. You, I mean, Anna, <laughs> you can back up that comment. I was arguing with my wife right before the show started. You heard it on the cell call. And I said, honey, I got to go because Oren needs me. He's the boss. Yeah, I heard it. I did hear it. Uh, that's, that's how it works. 
I do need to figure out if this mic is like not going to echo because I do want to talk. I want to say. Uh, <laughs> what do you want to say? That uh, I, I, yeah, I, I totally own you, bro. <laughs> you do own me. <laughs> <laughs> I own you. You own me, bro. By the way, who owns Hikaru back there? Is Georg Meyer getting frisky with that gun for those who caught that in the back of their eye? Wow. Meyer. <laughs> Meyer and Hikaru have not been getting along in the office, and that got weird back there. So, for those of you who caught it, um, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> oh, shout out to Hikaru! He has just joined us in the chat. Hikaru, have you seen Studio C, or should have we bring it back for you? Then it was just this. Yeah, Hikaru, thanks for being here, dude. Video. And and you and Meyer need to work out your relationship there. Meyer's holding you hostage right now in the office. Um, mm -hmm. we'll bring it back up here if you want to see it, just because I think that. I think that some people got a little nervous about that. Like, when did when did that start happening? Does someone want to talk to Meyer about his behavior? Things have been getting a little wild around here. Yeah. By the way, I forgot to shout out all our homies from Florida that are watching the show. It's just like, there's a ton of people. You know, Flo Grown right here. Florida! So hi! Love it! Anyway. Tacos. Tacos. Um, all right, back to the chest. Um, so, this game here between Shimanov and... and, and uh, Fabiano, more and more critical. I can't wait to hear what Hikaru thinks about the position. Hopefully he'll give us his opinion in the Twitch chat. F5 by Shimonov actually looks really good. I think Shimonov's mm -hmm. playing for a win here, for, despite the two minutes. I mean, opening up the new target, the bishop coming to F6 to hit C3. Hikaru, what do you think, buddy? Shimonov have winning chances here? We'll look. I'm a little worried that after 93, putting pressure on the G4 pawn, uh, he also has the possibility at some point to push f5. So ah. if white can get that in the right moment, then black's position can also fall apart. Uh, to be totally honest, I didn't see that. The knight coming to e3 and g4 and f5, that's actually a really strong idea. It also could come into c4 uh, because the d5 pawn is pinned. So that knight has a number of different ideas there. In fact, maybe Shimonov suddenly regretting f5 because now the time is ticking away and he hasn't moved yet. If you play f5 and your opponent plays the most obvious move to on passant, and you don't take back, something tells me that maybe, maybe you miscalculated something. He forgot about something. the on passant for a moment. Now, of course, uh, this is something he must have seen, but I really wonder what's the follow-up after 93. He's shaking his head, so that's the follow-up. No, I, I think I think he's shaking his head because of exactly what you pointed out. On, I think that was a great point, that um, the knight coming into e3... Now he's willing to give up the g4 pawn, um, partly because he probably didn't have a choice. Fabiano's going to be choosing between f5 and knight takes g4 here. I think um, that's how bad the position is. f5 was, I really overreacted to that move. I do that from time to yeah, time. Yeah, and uh, Hikaru said in the chat that if you're playing for a win, why do you go f5 and not f6? Although the problem would have been the same with, uh, with the capture on f6. So he clearly m must have missed this knight e3 idea. Yep. Yeah. I spy with my little eye and Eric Rosen, who's being held against his will. <laughs> Shout out to Eric. And that great Photoshop that he has created. Yeah. Remember, there he everyone. Is. He can over. Win a... I know you hear me. I know you hear me. <laughs> Don't you pretend. You can win a one year Diamond membership if you create a Photoshop similar to Eric. So check out the hashtag ProChess. That's how you can submit it on social media, hashtag ProChess. Well, someone asked earlier in the show if we hadn't had any draws yet, and, and it was in the Chess TV chat. He was right at the time, but he's wrong now. We do have our first peaceful result of this match, which is actually, I think, saying something in and of itself, right? Isn't is uh, that's uh, that's the first time we've had a draw yet. So there you go. So and Robson. Yeah, and I see once again the new emoto chess.com coming up. I'll just use it in the chat too and remind everybody what happened in, in this epic place, the beautiful brick wall and the Webster Windmills producing one of the most viral chess clips ever. Yep. Well, Shimonov is uh, trying to stay awake right now as as uh, Fabiano slow jams him. He just turned on some Jamie Foxx, lit a candle, dimmed the lights and set the mood. He's about to be put to bed by Fabiano right now. Ooh, what a pop cultural reference. Yeah. Um, and with that jacket, Rosen looks like he's about to hit the club after this. He'll do some different kind of Jamie Foxx tunes. Um, <laughs> Shout out, Derek, one more time. Check out his Photoshop and, in general, his channel. Today, he's not streaming, but he's supporting his team as usual. And he knows that he's on camera, of course. He yep. knows it. 
Ilyen Jézsnek has won his game, he has won two games, it could have been three out of three if he converted his first round game. What kind of tease that? Eric, let us know in the chat. Of course, this is a very important question too. Um, all right, well, Fabiano needs to win this game, though. We've been having fun talking about it. We showed Shimonov, who shook his head. I think he agreed with all of us on the second glance that F5 was indeed just a blunder, because as soon as Fabiano took F6 and played knight E3, it was clear that somebody was going to fall here, either the G4 pawn or the F5 and D5 pawn. So now he's just down in the live position, and here comes Fabi. The move C4... I think it's based on the idea that knight takes b4 will be met with rook b3, skewering the knight and the pawn on b7. So um, I'm liking Fabiano's strike back. If that's the case, that means there's one game left that uh, would keep this thing even. But no, St. Louis looks like they're about to grab a lead. Nicholas Theodoro is just totally crushing here up the exchange. So... Uh, hmm. He had a better position earlier, a pawn up and knights and exchange up. Exchange and also those pawns, the E&D pawns are unstoppable. So this is a win for Nicholas and for the archbishops that will make it a tie, five and a half, yep. five and a half, and Fabiano's game will decide. Let's keep an eye on both these games step. if we can here down the stretch. We've got Grabinski and Theodoro, and now we've got, uh, we've got both. We've got Grabinski and Theodoro with, uh, unfortunately, Grabinski about to fall. And we've got Fabiano moments away, I think, from beating Shimonov, especially now that uh, Alex is under 30 seconds. Oof, 18 seconds left. It has been a crazy game, but I think somewhere in the middle game, if Shimonov had more time, he probably could have used a situation where the White Queen was almost trapped on the King's side. Now, this c3 pawn, this pass pawn is the last hope of black, but I think it will simply be stopped. The bishop, well, no, the bishop will not go and stop it because he nope. has to be protecting g3, but he can go knight he can go e1. bishop e3, though, right? I mean, because you could just take f6 here first. Oh, I, th true. I think you could that take the bishop on f6. And if uh, if c2, yeah, so you, could even, you could even take c2, the rook on... Bishop no. Uh -huh. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it takes f6, c2, and then if Bishop e3, rook takes g3, okay. But maybe that's also okay, or he can just simply go knight e1 here. I don't really see what black will do, mm -hmm. even if it's his turn. Okay, well, Fabiano taking his time, making sure he finds the accurate approach. We see Grabinski is uh, barely, barely holding on for one more move. I guess sometimes you just keep the game going a little longer. It gives your team a little more kind of emotional emotional support that anything could still happen, right? Yeah, and at this very moment, the windmills are up one point. It's five and a half, four and a half in the favor of Webster, but, but yeah, they're... with the victory of Theodoro, it's going to be five and a half, five and a half, and Fabiano is also winning, so they're turning the tables in round three, and the Archbishops have draw odds, so they only need eight points yep. to move on to final four. And with that, we actually are down to just our final game now between Mr. Fabiano Caruana and Alexander Shimonov. Um, and so, like you said, the Bishops are looking to take a one-game lead here in the last round, but they also only need eight points. That means they're a point and a half away from punching their back-to-back -back ticket, actually, to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, of all the teams remaining left, two of the, actually three of them have been... Uh, to the to the PCL finals in in San Francisco before um, Chengdu, St. Louis, and Armenia have all been there before, and they're trying to get back. Yeah, and the position we have is now two minor pieces versus a rook, but uh, White is stopping the C pawn, and he will start pushing the G and F pawns. Yeah, I think Bobby was just considering there whether he even had to worry about this idea, um, or if he should just be pushing his pawns. But actually. Yeah, this has won a piece, yeah, so now it's an exchange. Very creative uh, approach there. In fact, as Commissioner Greg Shahadi said in the chat, White could take on F6, but maybe White shouldn't have taken F6, right? Um, mm. Maybe it wasn't necessary. Perhaps your 91 suggestion earlier, Anna, was the right approach to show everybody. Anna, Anna suggested the safe way here with 91, and I think she was right. I think this would have been the simplest way. Instead, Fabiano took while we were talking about the finals, and... Ultimately, Shimonov has made this 
This is not going to be an easy game to win now, despite having the two pawns. Oh, but why does he go to f6? I thought he should keep the king on squares where he doesn't get checked. So uh, light squares, not e5. dark squares. <laughs> You have to be super careful here. The king gets to e5, and then it's going to rush to d6. I thought king f6 just stepped into everything, because g5 came with a tempo, bishop c5 came with a tempo, and now I believe the pass pawns are way too advanced. So yeah, this wouldn't be the first time that... Uh... This wouldn't be the first time Webster was eliminated by St. Louis because of draw odds, if that's indeed what happens, as we just showed that in the inaugural season of the Pro Chess League 2017, um, the Windmills met the same fate, eliminated from the playoffs because of draw odds. So um, sometimes yeah, you have this like, you have this like big brother yeah. who's just like across town and is just like a little bit bigger than you and, you know, has like a really nice fancy chess club and... You know, just gets the best players on their team. I've had a big brother like actually now bishop f six and then g seven is is lights out because the bishop was guarding g one. I mean, he didn't go for it. Yeah, he just simply went for the c pawn. Yeah, he's still winning because if f five is ever taken g seven, there is no rook g one. The rook will be forced to passivity on the eighth rank. And here comes Fabi's pawns. Oh, G7 yeah, is killer. It threatens Bishop, Bishop F8. F8 and the flex. Yeah, very, Alex very and... nice. The threat no. here to finish this off, everybody, was the move Bishop F8, which would have cut off the rook. Putting your rook on that square is just resigning because now your rook is trapped and you're just down two pawns. And moving the king to G6 would meet a similar fate where the king is completely stuck to guarding it and the rook is alone to face the, uh, face the king and pawns here. Something like this. And it's just going to... Be too little, too late. The rook doesn't handle king, kings and pass pawns as well as you would think. So, um, Anna, is this what is this how you think the uh, the bishops would be handling the windmills, or or are we are we impressed right now and surprised that they're they're in a, they're in a great position here headed into the last round? Yeah, I'm surprised how well they scored in this round because from the positions we saw. Uh, especially this game between Karulana and Shimanov. I thought that in the middle game, Fabi may have been in trouble, but he had better time management. Yep. So it was crucial that during this game, Fabi had always more time than Alexander. And that ultimately helped Fabi win this game. I see Wesley so in the chat. He was saying, oh, wait a second. I want to read it. Aryan Tari is also here. Shout out to Grandmaster Aryan Tari from the Norway Gnomes. Yep. They're talking about Magnus, apparently, in the chat, so it may not be connected to the game. They're, uh, they're in discussion, and again, you can find lots of awesome conversation on all the different chat rooms available to you, but as Mr. Grandmaster <laughs> Blue Wizard, uh, Denny's Boros, just said, there's still one round to go. It's not over yet. I think he was talking to me. He's like, Danny, it's not over yet. Shut your yapping. We still got a little bit more chess to be played, and he's right. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be back in just 30 seconds as Ann and I take a quick uh, refreshing chocolate break off camera. And we will return Yay. with the final round here. And, and really, this is it. In, in about 30 minutes, we will know who is representing the Atlantic Division in San Francisco. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Put the gun away, George. We won't need bullets for these chess games. On April 3rd, the first ever Chess.com Bullet Chess Championship gets started with the first of two qualifiers. On Friday, we'll have a round robin event, and all three of these players will join five of the most elite bullet players on the planet. Unofficial Bullet Chess Champion Hikaru Nakamura will be defending his title versus Sergei Karyakin, Maxime Vache Legrave, Alexander Grishuk, and Levon Aronian. And as we said, Three qualified players means it's anybody's game. 
Tune in on April 6th and 7th when this eight-player elite bracket goes down. And join us for live commentary at twitch.tv slash chess, chess.com TV, and everywhere tickets are sold. Be there. And we are back before the last round is getting set to start. And as everyone just saw there, remind you, make sure you mark your calendars for our biggest event in April. Because after the Pro Chess League playoffs send us to San Francisco, we have about a month off. The, the finals in San Francisco will be May 4th and 5th. So our first ever Bullet Chess Championship will take place April 3rd through 7th with numerous qualifiers. And uh, some of the world's best already committed to the to the final eight bracket, which will be taking place on Saturday and Sunday, April 6th and 7th. So pretty exciting. I'm not sure who's going to qualify. Um, it it, uh, it should be should be epic. I know there's some of the best bullet players on chess.com have already kind of expressed their um, frustration that they didn't get an invite to the main event. And I said, how could I deny you the 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 pleasure of qualifying? Why would I do that to you? So make sure you qualify. <laughs> so, um, anyway, going to be pretty fun. Make sure you check out the uh, the Bullet Chess Championship. And uh, before the last rounds get to begin, you, it was a great conversation. If you're on chess.com, if you're not on chess.com, you should be. Tons of grandmasters going at it, throwing down with a little smack talk. Grandmaster Wesley So saying that they're going to beat the gnomes in the finals. And Ariantari saying that uh, they don't have a chance. Wesley says you don't have Magnus. Ariantari says we don't need him. And it just goes on from there. Um, so, anyway, lots of fun. Thanks for being with us on any chat room, whether you're at twitch.tv slash chess, chess.com TV, or in the chess.com live server. Uh, thanks for being here. Give us a follow before you go anywhere. This is the Pro Chess League. It is the biggest, most global event in the game, and we are now in the quarterfinals. We are about to find out who one of the four teams are that will move on to San Francisco. Uh, so, uh, so here we go. Indeed, this is the last round between the Windmills and the Archbishops, and the Archbishops only need to make it to eight points. That is, if they score one and a half points out of the last four games, then they will move on to the semifinals in San Francisco on May the 4th and the 5th, the live esports event that we are hosting. And we hope that you will be there with us. Tickets will be soon available, so stay tuned for the announcements. And yeah, I just also wanted to give a big welcome to all 3,576 of you tuning in to this epic match. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't get it doesn't get more thrilling than what we're about to see here in the last round. Only one game separates the teams, and uh, board one on board one action, right? The kind you pay to see here. Uh, we've got Ray Robson against Fabiana Caruana with opening theory being played that uh, the kind you might even see at a U.S. championship here in a mainline Spanish, a mainline Roy Lopez. And uh, after rook b8 and d3, this is pretty typical stuff. Black is going to play for d6 in this position, everybody, to protect the uh, the e5 pawn. And then look to do things on the queen side. You have ideas of knight a5 in some positions. Um, you can also, depending on how aggressively you want, to open up the B file and use the Rook. There's a lot of options here, which is, again, it's actually these Spanish games you see at the highest level, Anna, because there's options for both sides, right? Black has flexibility on the Queen side, which allows you to kind of out-prepare and out-trick your opponent. And White prefers this sort of slow center pawn game so that you can play for maybe C3 and D4 and kind of... You know, players at the highest level want the ability to out-prepare and kind of kind of out... out um, outmaneuver their opponents. They don't want just force theory when they're playing for a win, because if it's forced, most likely it might be a draw. So, um, it'll be interesting to see. Okay, Ray Robson takes. Now I expect C3. Um, yes, that would be a completely normal follow-up. Now that the A file is open, of course, the Rook on A1 is happy, and this is one of the funny ways you can activate your pieces, especially Rooks. You open up the A file, and you don't need to move the Rook from A1. It's already an active piece. It may go to A7 when it can, but at the moment, the Knight is covering the A7 square. Yeah, so it's uh, strategically, or structurally, I guess, symmetrical, right? But but different types mm -hmm. of space advantages for both. White can also consider the move Knight C3. And C3 with D4 is not the only option in this structure. Um, now that the tension on the on the queen side has kind of been clear, you could you can play for knight c3 and sometimes be a little more aggressive coming into ideas like knight d5, as well as bringing the knight from e2 to g3, sort of the more traditional Rui Lopez plan. Um, all right, so we'll see what Robson goes for. In the meantime, we've got our game between the board threes, 
And this one is not going to disappoint. This has been arguably the top performer for the uh, for the windmills has been Ilya Nizhnik. I know you're saying, Danny, look at the scoreboard. Ray Robson has two and a half out of three. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can I just go back to, to <laughs> for one second to the Caruana game? Because I've just realized that Wesley is very active once again in the chat in that game. And he was suggesting the same move as you, C3. And he also pointed out that he's up 2-0 against Ilya. So... Sorry, I got a little distracted by what's on camera, but it was well timed oh, by no. you to uh, to bring back uh, the the point of Wesley So being active in the chat. Look at Wesley So. If you're not on Chess.com right now, you should be. While also watching our commentary, don't leave our show. But Grandmaster Wesley So is multitasking trash talk and chatting in Fabiano's game while playing himself. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, he says right now he's at the he's at the rest day of the U.S. Championship, but he says it's not really rest because they're playing the Pro Chess League. But he's also, I guess, just supporting his Siamese twin, right? We'd say Wesley, focus on your own game, and he's like, yeah, but my twin is right here next to me. His head is right there. I can't get rid of him if I want to. So he's going to keep focusing on Fabiano's games, apparently. Um, Keep those photoshops coming, guys. Hashtag Pro Chess to use if you have created your picture to combine Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So as one kind of creature, human, animal, mythological figure. Anything you can whatever come up into, with right? for a one-year Diamond membership. Whatever, whatever you're into. And uh, yeah, Diamond membership's waiting. Like I said, the game with Theodoro and Nizhnik will not disappoint because it's already a very, very sharp night off with Theodoro playing about as aggressively of, of an approach as you can here. Um, mm -hmm. but he just committed the knight to d5 really early in this line. Now d5 is under fire, and probably he has to play knight c6 if he wants to hold it. And normally that's okay in these knight orfs. I've played these positions for both sides, but the problem is that in this particular position, I don't know that it doesn't just lose a pawn. Knight takes d5, undermines the protection. If we trade everything, then c6 falls. Um, if you take e7, then I can I can take with my knight back, and I'm de I'm I'm still defending everything. I know that knight d5 is a very common positional approach. Like I said, mm -hmm. play these positions for both sides. But I th I think this is an opening blunder, and I hate to say that so early, but um, he just he was just the recipient of a blunder last game, and and maybe Theodoro is returning the favor here because I already I really don't like this position as white here in this knight orf. Hmm. Yeah, it's going to be a good question how he can deal with the d5 uh, pressure. The pawn is about to fall. Knight c6, as you suggested. He goes g5. Whoa. He's all in now. I, he knows he... I'm telling you that uh, knight d5 was premature because... And just to provide the lesson uh, more fully for everybody watching, part of the reason is that... Um, so in, in these structures, knight d5 is something white is often looking for, and it's precisely because once you get this pawn to d5, you get access to the light squares on c6. The difference is that very often if that happens and you end up getting c6, it's because this light square bishop is the one parting ways with the trade, either from e6 or b7 in a knight orf. The problem with this position is he played knight d5 really aggressively, but black was able to trade and keep the dark, the light square bishop, and that should be like a warning sign for any anybody playing white in the knight orfs here. If you're ever about to change the structure and not win the bishop pair, be very careful with the pawn weaknesses you're creating, because a lot of the main lines of these English attacks are kind of based on you getting these positional access points because this light square bishop is off the board. But I can't drag it off the board because the damn chess.com bugs don't let me. So, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the problem for black, and uh, there you go. I think that um, Nizhnik is actually already in fantastic shape, and he's just won a pawn. So this is this is not this is not good for the bishops, but good for, good for the windmills if they're going to make a comeback. Yes. Yeah, so once again, the situation is as follows: the archbishops have draw odds because they finished better in the regular season of the Pro Chess League. So that gives them draw odds. It means that in case of an 8-8, the Archbishops move on to the semifinals. The winners need eight and a half points, so they have to score three points out of four games in this last round. That is the situation. Yep. But if Nizhnik wins, maybe they're on their way, right? We talked about the fact that Robson, mm -hmm. we know, has his work cut out for him in this Lopez. He did indeed play C3, as Wesley and I both suggested. Uh, but what about the game of, <laughs> of board twos? Shimonov and Wesley So now underway. Um, uh, this is theory, but I don't know anything about this line. Anna, you got to help me here. Mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know anything about this line. 
Yeah, it's been the Trumpowski. I can't claim I'm an expert on the Trumpowski, but I can say in general, as it's kind of obvious, what gives up the bishop for a better pawn structure. So he's doubling black pawns. The f6 and f7 pawns are doubled. Also, it weakens the king if black castles king side. But for that, black has the pair of bishops. And uh, what's happening afterwards, c4, d takes c4, queen a4, is that white gives up this pawn temporarily. He goes queen a4 instead of bishop takes c4, just so that he can take on c4 either with the queen or the knight d2, knight takes c4 with the knight, and the rook is coming to d1. The biggest rival in the protest league, according to Alex Shimanov, was and is, of course, the St. Louis Archbishops. And he said that before even this match would have been anywhere near, I believe. I was going to say, it's an interesting mindset, right? St. Louis is denying the Webster's arrival. It's like, I don't even want to acknowledge that my little brother exists. And Webster's like, you're my biggest rival, right? So um, <laughs> we, we've had a similar a similar sentiment expressed from, from different players on both teams. I think you did a great job explaining it. You said you didn't know the Trumpowski. Yeah, that was, that was a really good explanation. And the balance here, as you said, Black has... The open king and a bad pawn structure, but in compensation, he's got the bishop pair, and and currently he's even got this pawn on c4 as extra because taking it back as white um, gives things to black, right? Uh, if you take it, black is getting an initiative because of this time you've lost. Even even bishop d7, bishop c6 is in the air, hitting the queen. Um, note that if the queen ever leaves the c2 square, then we got we got other kinds of problems with a rook on a1. So. This is going to be a dynamic one as well. Right now, it's it's exciting because I think every one of these boards amongst the top players, the board two battle, the board one battle here, they all have two results in the making. I think Nizhnik is really in great shape here. He's just up upon and up on time in the Nidorf after Theodoro's blunder. So what about our last game, the board four? Bloomer versus Grabinski, the Josh battle. The battle, yeah, the of, battle Josh's. of Josh's. According to a pro chess league commissioner, Raksha Hade, he said at the beginning of the match that he thought that this game, the Josh versus Josh game would decide the entire match. So let's he, let's see if he's right okay. and this will be the decisive one. And again, if some of you happen to just be tuning into the Pro Chess League for the first time, then uh, click that follow button before you go anywhere. This is the biggest event, biggest global event really in chess. It is a, a global mm -hmm. league with 32 teams from five different continents, $50,000 in prizes. And uh, we are now down. This is our... This is our second to last match. We're in the quarterfinals here, um, sending sending two teams, sorry, four teams to compete in San Francisco on May fourth and fifth for the live the live uh, finale, where uh, where both the semis and the finals will take place. So, there you have it right there. These are all the teams that have been battling in the playoffs. Of course, thirty two teams to start, but of the sixteen teams that made it, we are down to these eight, and we're about to find out. Who's moving on for the Atlantic between St. Louis and Webster? So don't go anywhere and uh, stick with us. Yeah, you know, it's fun about the team aspect. You said, Anna, that, again, yes, there's Ray Robson and Fabian Caruana, but whoever, if Robson and Caruana drew, for example, and Nizhnik mm -hmm. took care of his business and won, then Greg might be right. The, whoever wins this game here between the two Joshes could end up sending his team to San Francisco. Yeah, that's true. So it may, it may be the right prediction we shall see greg usually isn't right so i would be surprised if in this case it worked out but yeah there's oh, a chance that was awesome yeah. and you know why you could get away with that because you have the microphone and he doesn't because he, he may be the commissioner <laughs> but you're right greg is rarely right around chess.com we have a saying it goes like this greg is always right that's how it goes we say greg is always I'll right and then nod. we nod I'll away no i'm nod. kidding we love we love you, Greg. Nod. Um, <laughs> all right, Queen A four is played. This is a a Nimzo Indian defense turned kind of a, a sort of hybrid Tartikauer kind of QGD structure. Black is going to play Bishop to B seven and often try uh, try for C five uh, to undermine White's stronger center pawn. But the problem is that if you open up this Bishop on C three, then you've got other issues over here on the king side. So. Um, Queen a4 also threatens bishop c4, right? Is that the idea? But but let's say bishop b7 by Grabinski, bishop c4, the queen would just slide to h5, and, and now your best move might just be the bishop back to e2. So um, so I'm not sure that, uh, that white is really going to play bishop c4 here. Yeah, I agree with you that it would be very... Uh 
very tempting to attack the queen, but if he has to go back to e2 afterwards, then it doesn't make that much sense to play bishop to c4. I think black is doing very well in this game. I like this queen bishop battery on the long diagonal. I don't think he has any trouble, especially if he can push c5 in the right moment and, of course, develop the b8 knight. Yeah. Shall we go back to another game? I feel like the Theodoru Nizhnik game is heating up with this king on e8 and the e5 pressure, but also the white king is vulnerable. Yeah, well, but this is white. White is already in all in mode in this game, right? Because when you blunder the d5 pawn out of the opening, you're, you're kind of left with nothing but uh, nothing but aggressive intentions. Nizhnik. Now, no night orf is ever a walk in the park anyway. Even if your opponent blunders, that's mm -hmm. kind of you kind of have yeah. to know that. If you're playing a night orf, you have to have thick skin for your king being in the center. Um, but yeah, I really like e6 to relieve the pressure. Not because you're going to play d5 or anything, but you're just getting rid of e7 as a threat so that you can possibly take on c3. And you know what I think he's going to meet bishop f6 with, Anna? I think he's just going to play rook h5 and bring the rook up aggressively Ooh. to the fifth rank, maybe even then to f5 or even c5 next. I like it. I like that idea that the rook could finally be an active part, uh, active participant of the game. So bishop f6 may be even helping black's cause. The bishop on f8 is also undeveloped, but it's doing a good job protecting the d6 pawn at least. And with the, this extra pawn, yeah, black's king is pretty safe yep. in the middle of the board. Yeah, and this is, this is a tough one, I think. Uh, at first glance, sometimes basic principles of chess say, wait, white's got really open lines and open pieces and black has a king in the center and what's the problem but you know not only is black up a pawn this is again typical for those of you who don't play sicilians black has to be ready to play this kind of stuff and a lot of times black has this exact type of position and he's not even up a pawn and he's still okay with it right so that's why we know that nizhnik is better here um and there we see the young man on camera here nervous he knows he needs to win this one this is big for his team um to say the least so he is uh, extra focused and letting his pinky know it. Yeah, Nisnik has been the MVP of the windmills. Clearly, he almost won every single game. He had a good position, probably almost a winning position against Wesley. So in the first round that he spoiled and uh, lost eventually, but every other game he scored, and that included a win over Fabiano Caruana with the black pieces. Yeah. As he said, he said, this little pinky's uh, got an extra pawn, and I'm going to make sure the windmills can go wee-wee-wee all the way home. All the way to San Francisco. So he's on it. He's oh, on nice. it right now. Sorry, this is <laughs> us just having a little too much fun as we hear on the players. Me and, me and Orange shouldn't spend as much time together as we do. Uh, but players spending a lot of time together currently in St. Louis, both in the U.S. Championship and now in the Pro Chess League, are Ray Robson and Fabiano Caruana. Let's go back to them. I like the surgery, yeah. the surgery that's about to be performed on the light scores here. Let's get surgical up in this mm -hmm. and try to try to find some some entry points. Um, the biggest advantage or the biggest uh, takeaway I have from the game right now, Anna, is actually off the board. It's the fact that Fabiano's nearly up three and a half minutes, I guess, on time. Um, but mm. I but I kind of like I kind of like Robson's position. Um, despite Fabiano uh, being up on the clock. And uh, what a nice forehead. We have this uh, front row seat into Fabi's living room. I, I thought you were about to say we have a front row seat to his forehead, and I was going to be like, Anna, be nice. <laughs> also... But then I said it. <laughs> so um, how has Fabiano are... Caruana's They're forehead not before. become an emote yet? Can we make that emote? <laughs> well, I'm I dead serious because he does this every... Every championship Fabi plays for us. He plays the Speed Chess Championship, the Pro Chess League. This is this is the most commonly viewed version of Fabiano Caruana. Thank God he clearly washes his skin. He's got great complexion. Um, but uh, <laughs> we need to get an emote. I mean, seriously, for the Fabi forehead. I can't wait. I can't wait to use it. And guys, remember that there's a Photoshop contest still going on where you need to combine Wesley So and Fabiano Carona into one creature for a one-year diamond membership. That's right. That is Fabiano Caruana. For those of you who uh, maybe don't tune into the chess channel as often, that's the world number two player. And uh, this is an up-close and personal view of 
him in his apartment, and he's obviously playing very well and very focused. So jokes aside, we know that he's leaning in because he doesn't care what he looks like to us. He cares about playing good chess. So uh, Yeah, he cares about the statics of his moves and not how his webcam looks like. Well, now he's got to care about this knight, though, on f5. I, 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 Again, regardless of the time, I like Robson's position here. Um, and Naroditsky, when he joined us for that interview, Anna kind of made a comment that against the world's best, you don't have to create... It, they they will create the dynamic counterplay because they always want to beat you with white or black. And I think he's right here. Fabiano has played a very aggressive Rui Lopez. I mean, he pushed the G-pawn, willingly opening up his own king. And with it, you get a bunch of weaknesses like this. And again, a lot, a lot, a lot of chess to be played here. But if you were asking for winning chances for Ray Robson, I think you have them here. Yeah, uh, as uh, Dania said, it's great that top players or anyone who is higher rated than you will seek to create chances because they want to beat you. So that also gives you chances. It's a double-edged game. And I like that this knight has landed on f5. After bishop takes f5, knight takes f5, you have a new knight on the same outpost. What worries me is that the ray has less time, but he, I think he will now speed up. So he has great experience handling time pressure, and he usually doesn't go that much down. He will start playing much faster than yep. before, I believe. Whoa, let's go back to uh, Theodoro's game because even though he's, it's still quite possible. Wait, did Mystic just block a rookie five? I'm sitting here yeah, like it, rook, it, it, it. Queen takes c5, queen takes c5, d takes c5, rook d8 is mate. There's mate. And no, but the queen is trapped. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. Holy shenanigans. Wait, what are, I must be miss Does the queen really not have any squares? This is the match right here, everybody. This is... Ilya Nizhnik, who has been the MVP he... for the Webster Windmill, steps but into this. But he just this. blundered with seven. rook to c7. On... Yep, rook c7, giving up the da square was the mistake. And now we see Ilya oh my on screen. Gosh. He is struggling to come up with a move. He has to give up the queen. The queen he may guards have to f2. Play. The rook guards all of the third rank squares. He's losing the queen. His best option is probably to play rook takes g5. And then yeah. and then have a rook and a bishop for the queen, which unfortunately is probably just losing because white immediately infiltrates into the queen side and everybody's going to fall. Oh my gosh, that would be an amazing way for the windmills to just absolutely uh, give away this match because... In this position, everybody, to be clear, the point is Nizhnik was up a healthy pawn, as we said. Theodoro blundered in the Nightorf, but he lost sight. And this is why you always have to be aware of the potential of tactics on the board, even if they're not right in front of you. He lost sight of how dangerous the d8 square was by playing rook d8. And Theodoro punishes him with this amazing tactic. Again, as Anna said, if you trade, you get mated down a rook, but white wins with checkmate on the board. And anything else, of course, on e5 just leads to the same. I think he just, Anna. I, I was spying this as you were brilliant. saying. I, I saw rookie five come on the board. I was, I was like, wait a second. I went here, but I didn't realize the queen was actually trapped. I thought it was just like a cheap trick, like, oh yeah, black takes it, we get checkmated. Hashtag NBD. But actually, it's just, it's just winning. Yeah, this is the moment when Robert Hess would shout, Sam, Sam Copeland. This is a Sam Copeland moment. Oh my god. And the chat on chess.com, I see several titled players. Shout out to Benjamin Bock. He is a grandmaster on the Olympic team of the Netherlands and international master Hans Kuhn Lima. They are discussing the game, saying that this is an absolute beast move of the year. And Benjamin adding to it, tricky Greek. Yeah. This wow. Is, uh... Theodore definitely coming back from a difficult position. He dropped a pawn in the opening. He, we didn't think that he had much of a compensation, but now Rook C7 stepping into Rook E5. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Nizhnik is uh, not going to go down lightly, though. He knows how much his team needs as he's very, very focused. I think clearly a little bit uh, dejected with himself right now. This is a very frustrating position. Not nearly as, as relaxed as he was earlier, but... Uh... See if he can find a creative way to maybe give back the queen. I mean, this is so tough, though, Anna. You can't even take on d3 to try to get two rooks for the queen because you still get mated on d8. This is, 
There, there is no, there is no way out. Oh, okay. He's played rook to c4. We are about to see something completely crazy. So, if this works, everybody, what Nizhnik is saying is, if you take my queen, I take yours, and both rooks will fall. And in the end, I'm still up a pawn. The problem with this, I think, is the move queen a7 or queen to b6. And now queen the rook B6 is threatens mate on d8, and the queen is hanging. Yeah, now what the queen is still hanging, and they're B6. still mate. So I, I don't understand. He's going to play rook takes g5 then, but then it's the same thing. You, you get the queen, and I just start gobbling all the pawns. So I think, uh, I think queen to I'm b6 really is just completely winning. I'm really confused by rook c4. I thought your idea, rook takes g5, immediately had made more sense. Now the queen will enter the position, so queen b6 is just helping white yeah. to get the attack going. Queen b6. I mean, queen a7 is like probably also winning with like a mating net, but no, queen b6 is just very straightforward. The rook can't be taken still because of Jekyllina Lashlamba over here. This is just fascinating and, and an absolutely heartbreaking game for Nizhnik right now. Wow, he shakes his head. That is just absolutely heartbreaking. Um, yeah, no, this is a this is a tough one. This this. This is the match right here, everybody, and it's very surprising to me that we're calling that right now in the sense that there's still four more games going, but you can tell how how upset he is, which is uh, very, very upsetting. Super, super nice kid. Very, very, very talented guy, but unfortunately, this one just got away from him here. And again, it all happened yes. right here with this move, Rook C7. I think Vertich was making fun of me in the chat when I said the potential of tactics. I wasn't kidding. That's why you do your puzzle rush right there. <laughs> That's a problem. This is a heartbreak for the windmills. Yeah. It just may be in the end of the match uh, as their MVP goes down. Ilya Nizhnik, we said he could have scored four out of four potentially. He had a great position against Wesley, so and this game too. He was a pawn up and he was the one playing for a win. But then he just forgot about this tactical motif on the back rank. Yep. Mate on D8. It's so sad. Like he gets this game, and it was and it, it was anybody's game, and it, especially if uh, Grabinski somehow ends up winning for the windmills on the fourth board, which uh, possible still. I mean, that would have been that would have been the match, but unfortunately, and again, it's not not you know over over yet. But based on what we see on the board, I think that this is uh, just a huge moment here. So. Yeah, it's a heartbreaking moment for the windmills, and uh, of course, a great comeback by Theodoru in that game, and uh, a score that will make the archbishops basically win the match. They need, after Theodoru's win, they need just half a point more, and they have Fabiano's game, Wesley's game. Yep. Any of them can just make a draw, and I think they will score seems, more than that half seems, a point. Seems that is likely missing. they're on pace, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Fan eight one zero saying big surprise. Shahade was wrong. Thank you. That, I think that's that's a great comment. I, I stand by your side. Classic Shahade was wrong reference. Um, Shout out to Project State Commissioner Greg Shahade. Of course, this couldn't be done without Greg. It was his idea to form a league that would be international. So he created the Project League, basically from the US Chess League, which I think has been one of the best ideas for online chess and esports and chess. Couldn't agree more. Agree totally. And as we bring Fabi back on camera, we go back to his game where he's still facing pressure. But now Ray is really, really under time pressure. And as you said, he's used to time pressure. Ray is, Ray is uh, um, sometimes a stronger player with less time on the clock. And he's he's honestly had regular time pressure problems since he was a kid, knowing him. Uh, but uh, but he's very, very good, even with very few seconds on the clock. And and in this position, he's still better. Although it looks like with Fabi trying to force the queens off the board, he'll probably be, be guaranteeing himself a, a draw if he does. So Ray says, no, thank you. In fact, that's a good move because he's threatening rook e3, rook g3. So look out. Um, but again, it's all unfortunate because it seems right now that with Nizhnik on pace to lose, that that'll be all the bishops need. Now, again, it could be wrong, right? So how are we wrong? And how do the windmills come back? Well, technically a Nizhnik win does not clinch it. And a victory for Robson here. He's got this rookie three, rook g3 idea. Hmm. A victory for Shamanov over So, which uh, also a super interesting position. He sacrificed the exchange in order to get all these weaknesses against the king. Uh, and Grabinski also has his work cut out for him. So this is it's going to be tough, but it's not over yet. It's not over yet. That's the point. 
So yeah, it's only over in the board of Ilya Nizhnik where he's still playing the game. He has a rook versus the and queen. And he's actually that's, created that's a very creative here. blockade. Look at this. Yeah, so far he's protecting everything. Yeah. The rooks are protecting the a6 and a7 pawns, and there are no, there's no way to bring the white rook in. So he's trying his best. He's trying, but it would be really a miracle if he saves this game. I think the problem is white will play for rook d4 at some point and force the rook off, even at the expense of losing the f pawn, because the queen dominates the rook in any kind of pass pawn race. Yeah, and Theodora goes for it, because now you can't play rook a5. It'll just leave the rook loose to some sort of queen attack. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's probably going to spell doom for Nizhnik. As soon as one rook comes off the board, a6 falls, b5 is next, and the a pawn runs up the board. So, <laughs> Look at the new emote. What do we, we got? have created. We've already moved that emote. fast. Look at that. There we go. That's how magic D4 is happening. Hat. That's how magic happens. We got the Fabby Cam. Fabby Cam. <laughs> Oh, no, I think that's I'll almost a little to... bit too generous to letting his eyes be on screen, though. I mean, I think the Fabicam is a little more forehead centric, um, <laughs> but great work there. Great work there. Um, wow. <laughs> the, Our uh, producer not only running a broadcast for several thousands of people, but also creating the Fabi forehead in the meantime. Yep. The. Uh, the, the the quick quickest emote in the West as we call them. So um, the uh, anyway, shout out to everybody, all of our subscribers, all our premium members, everybody that's here, whether you're at Chess TV, Twitch TV slash Chess, or just the Chess.com live server, hanging out. Thanks for being here. So um, all right, Theodoro is gonna try to win the Apon, and you can see exactly why. Um, Nizhnik played rook at four. It's because of what I was highlighting. You don't want to race. The rook loses races to the queen for a living, right? That's what the rook does. It loses races because she's just more powerful. She operates on yeah. the diagonals, all that stuff. So he's choosing to keep the rook on a solid square that stops a pass pawn versus getting a pawn of his own. And as much as this is a, a you know a losing game still for black, I think it's instructive for everybody here. You know, learn learn to defend like these grandmasters even after they blunder. Because actually, if, if Nizhnik gets the rook to c4, where it's protected by the pawn, Anna, it protects the pawn. Again, this is just this is not just like over, over yet. Nizhnik is putting up a lot of tough defense. Yes, I'm surprised that he has managed to create this kind of an almost fortress where everything is protected. So White will have to make a lot of effort in converting this into a full point. And on the other board, the Robson game. Oh, wow. Well, that, that's over. <laughs> what in the world? Let's back it up and take a look at how Fabiano that won his just black. Finished. Because Fabi Cam. The Fabi Cam strikes back, right? All he needed was an emote in his honor to go to go nuts. And it started with this move D5. Wow. Just super Amazing aggressive. It's a, it's a sacrifice of the pawn to get the back rank. And I think Ray just missed how problematic that was because everybody just fell apart. And uh, again, you know, we, we applauded Ray for getting uh, for being a strong time pressure player because um, he is uh, typically. But no matter who you are, getting yourself under that type of devastating time pressure against someone who's as good as Fabiano Caruana. Just look at this. If you can see the clock as I click through, Ray was literally living off the increment here, barely getting mm -hmm. time back. When you have four seconds, that means you made a move with two seconds, right? So it's just, you just can't play that way. And Fabiano does does work. And there it is right there. That's the shot I want. That's the <laughs> uh, that's the emote of the future right there. So, uh, all right. Well, good stuff. That Congratulations to Fabiano. Nice Either way, movie. jokes aside, and he's actually helping lead the way for the bishops to get back to the final four in San Francisco. Indeed, the Archbishops with Fabiano Carmona's victory are almost in. All they need is half a point more. They have a winning position on board three. That's Nicolas Theodore against Ilya Nizhnik. And also on the other boards, no one is really going down. So I don't... Or maybe Josh Bloomer, his position, this Rukan game, he's a pawn down. So it may be a board where the winners will score, but neither Wesley So nor Theodore uh, are in any danger of losing their games. 
Yep, I agree, and I, I think we're we're almost ready to to uh, call it here. At any moment, we are going to have a result in the books that sends the bishops back to their second uh, final four, and really their their third. Actually, for those of you who don't know, the St. Louis Bishops won. Uh, they won the inaugural season in 2017. They made it to the final four last year. They were eliminated in the semis. Um, and uh, now they're looking to get back. So uh, this is only the third year of the Pro Chess League, but I think you could argue that the St. Louis Archbishops are the most accomplished franchise in the league at this point. And uh, look at that. With uh, with Theodoro winning on time, that is it. Oof. The Bishops have officially clinched the Atlantic Division. We now have the final two games on screen uh, to take this one home. But congratulations, the Bishops have won the match already with a score of eight and a half, five and a half at this moment. Congratulations to the St. Louis Archbishops. And of course, it's a heartbreak for the windmills uh, for them. The Pro Chess League has finished with this match. It is the Archbishops that move on to the final four. As Danny has pointed out, it's going to be on May the 4th and 5th in San Francisco, the live esports event that you all will want to be at. So stay tuned for the ticket announcement. Yep. And uh, Grabinski is... Uh... Doing well here is Black, and if indeed it had come down to the Joshes, then perhaps this game here would have decided it. I'm I'm honestly really surprised. I expected Fabi to be as good as he is, but I think that if Nizhnik had won his game, um, you're yeah. looking at six and a half, seven and a half still, maybe uh, maybe Grabinski there. So I, you know, again, it's not not a surprise in terms of the final result. Everyone and uh, and their cousin uh, would you know would tell you that the uh, the bishops are a heavy favorite to win it all. They are every year. They're they're a great team, but. But, um, you know, unfortunately for Webster, just not their best day as the match has already been clinched here. Um, and uh, there you go. We have a score of 9-6 to six with one game left in the books. And Webster has just made a draw in a position which I don't really understand. Why is it a draw? Uh, Knight G4 and White offered a draw. Maybe Wesley just thought he may, he may not have seen the results on the other boards. Or he just wanted to seal the deal, but they have won the match. Well, I think already. he knew they had won the match, and he probably just was like, "Well, let's take a draw. I'm tired. I got the U.S. Championship to play tomorrow. The match is won, right?" If I had to yeah, guess, Wesley so just... offered the draw. Did he? If I had to guess, but um, um, it was his turn to move, so I thought. It was knight g4 and the draw offer, okay. but yeah, so maybe in any case, just, maybe not. Yeah, I, uh, it's just interesting that he would accept it when he's two exchanges up. Yeah, knight f6 is a threat, but you can take on e2 and play f5, and you win more material. It's a rook up in the end. Yep. Um, and uh, okay, so there you go. That position was a draw, but the final game still going on. Maybe, maybe uh, Grabinski's going to get this one here. It looks like. He, it should be a draw, and part of the reason, everybody, is that um, as long as White can keep this king from running to this side of the board, if the pawn ever gets to the second rank, it's just a, a draw because uh, the g-pawn can't ever force the white king away. But, but actually now as I say that, it looks like Black is getting himself in a position to make a run for it. Okay, you have, mm -hmm. to, be, have to be careful here. I don't know that g5 was necessary. You definitely want to bring the... No, is he? I think he's going the wrong way right now. I think Rubinsky needs to four. focus on bringing the bringing the king to the queen side to help to help the b pawn up. Shout out to Sungrazer uh, there with the tier one sub. We really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Um, the thing is that White doesn't have the third rank, so in other positions you could he could give a check. On the third rank for the Philidor. Ah, uh, yeah, for, good point. So on this the is... king on the third rank for the Philidor defense, but now with the pawn on b3, he never has the chance. Yeah. So, so there were, may there have were been numerous, numerous ways to win. Now yeah, you can play b2, now. it doesn't matter okay. because uh, you're getting a queen, and Grabinski does get the win for the uh, wind wheels, which proves Greg Shahadi wrong in more ways than we could have even hoped for on live camera, <laughs> right? That just makes everybody, that's that's a win-win for everybody. Um, but uh, <laughs> Poor the uh, the windmills indeed are, are, are saying goodbye to their 2019 Pro Chess League campaign. And uh, it's, uh, it's sad for them, but it is a, it is a very good day for a lot of people in St. Louis, their crosstown rival, the archbishops eliminate them. 
and they will be headed to San Francisco for the back-to-back back-to-back year. And uh, Anna, um, final final thoughts on the match before we take a quick break. And I am joined by Grandmaster Robert Hess to help me bring home the Pacific. You need to go to bed. You have some chocolate waiting for you and some bedtime waiting for you. Thank you, and I just wanted to thank all of you who tuned in to the quarterfinals of the Projects League, this match between the Windmills and the Archbishops, the match for who is the best team of St. Louis and maybe of the United States if the Blizzards will not make it through. Who knows? It's going to be now up for the Minnesota Blizzards to prove that they can qualify to the San Francisco finals against the Chengdu Pandas, who played the finals last year against the Armenia Eagles. So it's a tough team. But I'm curious to see how it's going to go. Good luck to you as well, Danny, for the double shift. I think now you will feel how Robert has been doing the entire season. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Anna, this has been this has been a lot of fun, a super exciting match. I had a great time. I know that the the chat did. We're going to let you let you uh, let you go spend your spend your night there. Um, and I know it's getting late for you there in Europe. And uh, don't go anywhere, everybody, because right after our break. Grandmaster Robert Hess will be will be sitting here along alongside me. We will have the call for the Pacific Division, as Anna said. Anna, thank you so much, and uh, we will see you, I believe, on April second. Um, if not, then we will see you in San Francisco for the for the final Pro Chess League shows of the year. Indeed. See you guys next week, and stay here for the match between the Blizzards and the Pandas. I may come by because it's going to be difficult for me to fall asleep after a stream. It always is. It always is. All right. Thank you, Anna. We will, we'll see you later and don't go anywhere, everybody. We will be right back.